OTB AM. Brought to you by Avancard Reward Plus Credit Card. Powered by MasterCard. Straight up better than your current credit card. Avancard DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. All right, a very good morning to you. Welcome along to OTB AM. We're uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed and delighted to be here. Um, uh, there's a lot on the show today that we want to talk about, um, in particular the World Cup semi-final taking place in France tonight. It is um, one empire against another, one crumbling empire against another crumbling empire, the inventors of football against the usurpers. You kind of sit down and you think to yourself, which of these teams do I want to lose more? Oh no, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, 100% wrong in my case. I am 100% on board the Rapino train, go Team USA, go Team USA. The alternative is, though, that if we use the usual standard of judging English teams, it is, let's get uh, carried away in our aggression towards England getting carried away with their actual chances in the World Cup. And this is happening this year. There's no question about it. And it's happening deservedly. Their performance against Norway last week was brilliant. They outclassed an excellent Norway team. And they deserve to have that arrogance going in to the semi-final. Except for the fact that the team they're coming up against is one of the most arrogant teams in the history of sport. Are they that and arrogant? I, I think they... Are they? I think they are. because they celebrated 13 0 win? I mean, come they're, on. They're arrogant in the way that the <laughs> basketballers are arrogant in the Olympics. As in, they know that they are the best. They certainly think that they are the best. Some people think they aren't the best, but they certainly think they are, and to a certain extent, they know they're the best. And uh, they're kind of uh, rubbing that in to, to people's faces, and that's all well and good. I like that. But if we're actually judging the English by the same standard as the Americans, then, to be honest with you, are the English actually the more likable outfit? Euro for England, basically. Is what if, we're if we're using that standard, yes. But then again, maybe arrogance is just an American thing. Maybe Americans can just pull off arrogance a hell of a lot better than English people can, and it's actually far more palatable. They wear it like a cloak, like a, a well-designed designer cloak. Yeah, it doesn't really suit us over here, but it probably, well, maybe it does, it probably suits them over there a hell of a lot better. Maybe the Irish can pull off arrogance better than the English. Well, you, I mean, come on. You grew up on a diet of arrogance, right? Well, you know, Kerry football fan. It's not arrogance, it's just being the best. <laughs> there you go, there you go. You can pull that very well. So, no, I it do... Like, it fits like a glitter bone. I, I do admire... I do admire. I, I did also admire how uh, Rapino early in the tournament was just kind of like, I hope this whole thing is a complete and utter circus and I hope it's crazy. And th there has been many, many events that have made this World Cup a brilliant World Cup. The football has been one of them, thankfully, because after the couple of VAR incidents, after the Cameroon game against England, you were worried that there might be a cloud developing over this. But actually, the off-the-pitch stuff that has uh, enveloped the on-pitch stuff has actually been largely positive things, like Rapino saying, screw the White House, and I enjoyed like the Cameroon game. Am I, is, I mean, is that not, do we not all watch football to see a little bit of something happening? Is that not the whole point? Shithousery, some, th like that was world-class level shithousery, suitable, for a world-class stage. It was hilarious. Yeah, come on. This is like, it's exactly what you want. I, I, like, I think that's one of the things that made this tournament be something people started paying attention to. I did tune into England, Norway in hope that there would be a mad VAR call. I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny that. Uh, but what you end up getting when uh, you're hoping for a VAR call is actually some brilliant football as well. So I don't know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the two are linked. Maybe there was uh, an element of hilarity around the Cameroon performance that allowed people to, to get more enthralled by what we were actually watching on the pitch and these crazy dramatic scenes. And it's something that we're going to remember for years is the Cameroon shithousery. Like, step aside, Luis Suarez. There is a new sheriff in town. Yeah, exactly. So I like that, and um, I'm definitely cheering for the States tonight. I mean, and it's not even close. It's, I mean, no way would I consider cheering for that Phil Neville England team. I mean, yeah, great, okay, so they've vastly improved. There's some interesting narratives around them, but come on. Megan Rapino, come on. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, like, I, I, I can see I for can our see, ages. I can see your point. I can see your point, but how, uh, like... Am I getting carried away? Am I watching too much BBC? Has this English team not actually... <laughs> Colin Kaepernick absolutely uh, destroyed with uh, things on top of him. Um, have you not actually gotten to like this England team over the last couple of weeks in terms of how they conduct themselves, in terms of how they play? Like, oh, the US, who US cares about how they conduct themselves? Well, well like, come this, on, it's like, go on, the postman delivered the post today. Well done. This may be uh, actually something that plays into your narrative. The US have basically been spying on the English team. Yeah, I heard that. They were getting a tour of the hotel but to see where they're going to stay for the final. But exactly, it wasn't even spying in the end. It was actually checking out to see where they're going to stay for... They got, a, they got an escorted tour by the hoteliers, by somebody who works in the hotel as opposed to the owners of the hotel. It's like, I mean, if you're going to spy, you might not tell the hotel you're coming. If you're going to spy as well, you probably want to do it when 
the staff and the players are actually in the hotel. Everybody was absent from the hotel at that point. Did they expect to open a conference room? And it's like, wow, 4-4-2 this, this week. Incredible. And it's just standing up there in an empty conference room. I'm not sure what you would expect to find with. Yeah, maybe that's exactly um, what they did find because, you know, it's Phil Neville here. <laughs> Phil, ne Phil, Neville. Phil Neville has proven himself this tournament. He I'm sorry. May, he may be wearing the suit of Gareth Southgate, but is he really Gareth Southgate or is he still the... I mean, there was, a, there was an amazing... Uh, you know the yes no quiz that they used to do, and was it was it on uh, Soccer AM? It was definitely one of those early morning Sky things, and Phil Neville couldn't get the hang of the yes no. You know you're not allowed to say yes or no. Yeah, he just answered every question yes or no. <laughs> that was it. That was like a. Uh, we've uh, done that before and off the ball, of course, on uh, the Big Five Crappy Quiz of the Year, which uh, was a, a yes or no question. And it was basically uh, where you, you, it was like headbands where you put something on your head and you had to guess who was a sports person. So it was uh, Joe and Tommy were the team. And, the game's uh, called Shithead Home. Go on, I'll, I'll forgive your ignorance. I, I've never actually heard that phrase before. And uh, the name was Tyke Furlong. And uh, Tommy's first question was, are you a man or a woman? And Joe was like, <laughs> man. Ah. So uh, there was two of them. At least we, at least we had okay. two people actually. Uh, Joe and Phil Neville are on a similar level. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Uh, so, I, I think Phil Neville's actually kind of proven himself over, over the last In fairness, he's, he's a far better coach of um, this team than I had expected him to be, and they're still in the tournament. But I know Colin Kaepernick's up for tonight, and I'm on, I'm on Kaepernick's side. Um, and I think, that, I think that the Americans are the best team, so it would be good for football if the best team wins. Is it? Is it always? Why are you rooting for the best team? And what other... World Cup have you been rooting for the best team? I would have liked Argentina to win that time. I would have liked France to win the World Cup in 2006. They were the best team. They got, you know, a little bit hot-headed in the final and didn't see the deal out. In the last World Cup, are you not delighted to see the Germans crash out? Are you not delighted uh, to France see... France were the best team, no? You're not they were eventually over time, uh, but not going into the tournament. I mean, at, at this... Yeah, but I think over the, to over the course of the tournament, Anyway, I, look, it's, a, it's kind of relevant, right? I, like the, she's the best character, uh, it's the best story, it's a good time for Megan Rapinoe to be a leader of that team and saying what she did about Trump and the White House and all the other things she said about Trump being a misogynist and a racist and all that kind of stuff. That's like, it's amazing to hear the captain of a national team say that about a sitting president in an election cycle. It is, and uh, a captain of somebody who actually has a realistic chance of making the White House. It's yeah. one thing saying th uh, something like that and ac not actually not having any consequences for saying that, or perceived consequences, saying, ah, we, we wouldn't go to the White House, but there's actually a, a huge possibility that they are one of the most successful teams in American sports again this year, and that uh, the invite will become an elephant in the room and make things a little bit awkward, which is exactly what you want to do when you protest. We were at... Um Power squat yesterday. Oh yeah, to play golf. Working? Oh sorry. Yeah, working. No, it's working. It's definitely working. Laying down some future plans for some stuff. Um, more of which and on. I heard some stories about um, some of your family in New York, but I'll, I'll tell you those off air. On uh, after a very successful day at golf at at Paris Court Golf Club, the lads are getting ready for the Golf Weekly podcast. So that's um, you might not be able to see the picture there, but it's Nathan and Joe, and then at Connor underscore Sketches joins the lads in this week's Golf Weekly podcast live from at Paris Court Golf Club. So Paris Court's beautiful. I don't know if you've been out there, but yeah. here's Connor Sketches with the drive. Whoa. Oh, yeah. You can't hear the sound on that, can you? Golf shot. Oh, there's, Mur there's Murphy going. It's a great golf shot. <laughs> Straight down the middle again. <laughs> yeah, so we were playing with them. That was a snap hook left, but uh, Nathan was playing along to try and intimidate Kieran Donahue because um, Donahue is up against him today. What's the wager on that? Playing up against uh, Connor, I don't know. Like, surely they have a huge wad of cash on the line. Just reputation. No. Donahue is like Not a, good enough for me. If the lads don't have any money on the line, then this is pointless. Donahue's one of the most competitive sports people you're ever going to meet. Yeah. Right? So, like, if he loses to Connor, then that is one of the greatest upsets in the history of sport. Ever since, to, to tie this all neatly around, ever since 1950, when the US beat England by a goal to nil, and the English newspapers refused to print it, they thought it was 10-1 as opposed to 1-0 in favour of the US because it was such a big shock because they invented football, mm -hmm. couldn't be beaten by the Yanks. Ever since that happened, there's not been a shock as big in world sport as what would happen if Conor Sketches beats Keira Donny. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's right up there. That was, it, like, there's no chance that happened. So, the, I mean, Donny's reputation is on the line. And, and they're going to do shot clock from the Irish Open. Uh, so you're saying that Connor Sketches is crap or Donahue's very good? I'm just saying that, you know, Donahue's very good. Connor, Connor's got a busy life, hasn't had a lot of time at the practice range just recently. Does he not basically work for a golf channel? He does, yeah. 
Always on the course. Yeah, no, but you don't actually get to play, do you? You can't be like walking around going, I'm just going to hit a few balls here. They might think, what, what? No, that, that's, your wristband is a different wristband from the players. It's a good point. It's a good point. You can play like the, the crappy course. Is this like you covering Kerry over the league and you come back go to kick and freeze? Is that what happened? That's not, uh, that's not a fair comparison. That's exactly that's the same not thing. A, that's, that's not exactly what you said. Nobody, nobody who covers football really actually plays football to uh, uh, an, in their view, high level. Whereas everybody who covers golf fancies them as a golfer. Look at Golf Weekly. Tommy Rooney covers football to a high level and plays it to a level just below what Andy McIntyre needs. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, the below thing. No, exactly. Uh, who knows? Um, anyway, so that I, I, I had to leave before the show was recorded last night, but I'm, for the first time in my life, I'm genuinely looking forward to downloading an episode of Golf Weekly and listening to it through because um, he's very funny. He's had an amazing uh, meteoric rise over the last three years. was basically not, not quite on the dole, but went from that to um, working for... Uh, NBC and doing ads with Tiger and there's two more ads to come. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, so it's uh, and hanging out properly with Tiger Woods and actually kind of sitting down and having chats with him about normal day-to-day stuff. Water cooler chats with Tiger Woods? Well, sitting, sitting, sitting all day chatting to somebody and it turns out Tiger is not the um, social recluse that you might think when it comes to he's actually probably decent at chatting to people. I, did, I don't want you to get to like blow all the good stuff on Golf Weekly this week, but I'm interested in this, as in Tiger not being a, a social recluse. My view of Tiger would certainly be, if you're on a shoot with Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods has a lot of handlers. He goes into his truck or whatever it may be for a couple of hours. When you're ready to shoot, Tiger Woods will show up. Yeah, no. But obviously that's not the case. No, by all accounts, no. Right. Well, by all accounts, by the one account I got yesterday, no. <laughs> You'll hear more on Golf Weekly, no doubt. Yeah, of course. Uh, so here's what's coming up. Uh, sports page is coming your way, seven minutes late, as ever. Irish Open with John Duggan coming your way at 7.55. Eddie Brennan, the leash manager, who <coughs> has suddenly catapulted himself right into the conversation about who's going to be the uh, next successor to Brian Cody. Uh, he's going to join us at about five past eight. Ron Nagar is going to talk to us about life in La Rochelle or what it might be like. Uh, obviously, he's still down under at the moment. Uh, Arsenal's transfer window at 8.50 has been a bit of a disaster, as we'll get to in the papers in a minute. England, USA are going to preview that game for you around about nine o'clock, tell you what to look out for. And 9.15, Phil Sporting is going to be with us. You can tweet us on the hashtag OTBAM. Papers next on Off The Ball. But first, check this out. Join Off The Ball in Abu Dhabi this November 17th to 23rd for the inaugural Off The Ball Open. With flights from Dublin, five nights in a four-star hotel, golf and two championship courses, gala awards dinner, Peter Lorre Golf Clinic, and a live Off The Ball Roadshow. You can also hang out with some special guests, including Kevin Kilban and Kieran Donaghy. The inaugural Off The Ball Open. Book now at CassidyTravel.ie and check out OffTheBall.com. Oh yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, come with us if you want. Get on to Cassidy Travel and they'll give you the details. Okay, so the uh, papers, front page of the uh, Times and the front page of all the English newspapers as well. It's uh, Corey Coco Goff who beat her idol Venus Williams. She's 15. Sky's the limit for Goff. Uh, is that how it's Goff? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Beaten Williams tips 15-year-old conqueror for greatness and then night in desert drives England. So an interesting story from Phil Neville that they went to Qatar having been beaten 2-0 in, was it a friendly against Sweden? Um, it was a friendly, yes. Yeah. So Sweden hired them 2-0. Phil Neville had crisis talks after in a, at a January training session in Qatar, brought them out into the desert for dinner and uh, a night of Soul searching happened, and ever after that, they were all friends, and here we are in the semi finals. Uh, they are in the semi finals. Villa facing investigation. Aston Villa facing a Premier League investigation after selling Villa Park for 56.7 million to comply with profit and sustainability rules. The club's accounts for the year ending May 31st, 2019, were signed off by the EFL as compliant with its profit and sustainability regulations last month, but they've yet to be authorised by the Premier League, which received Villa's books last weekend after their promotion via the Skybet Championship playoffs in May. So, uh, Villa's finances were a bit of a mess. A couple of changes of ownership. Looked like they were going to the wall. Looked like Grealish was going to leave. And then new owner comes in. And, um, you know, there was a little bit of... a little bit of... creativity in the solutions that were found. The English Football League were like, yeah, off you go. Nothing to see here. The Premier League might be a little more circumspect when it comes to these issues. Are they okay? Is uh, I don't know. I mean, that would be that's the first question you'd have. That'd be a very villa thing to uh, get to the point where everything is looking good again. And suddenly, it's, oh no! Back page of the Mirror this morning is Splash the Cash Rash. Marcus Rashford there after signing his new three hundred thousand pound a week deal. 
including bonuses. He signed up at Old Trafford until 2023. Bernard Flynn is writing about Tyrone Redhands starting to right wrongs. He fancies Tyrone coming through the qualifiers. Big game against Cavan this weekend. Uh, O'Keefe, now we want the big one. That's their Wexford lead. And uh, Lilies just keep on winning, they say, also on the back page of the Mirror. Dundalk beating Waterford 3-0 last night. Uh, 15 love, Coco, Corey Goff, Dunn, Venus Williams, then Camley stated, I want to be the greatest. Uh, ring walk, a Tokyo shift as focuses now on 2020. So this is Kurt Walker, who has insisted the <coughs> European Games is only a stepping stone that's him pictured with his gold medal. And Zaha ha ha, Palace laugh off to Risery, five-year payment plan. This is one of the all-time uh, great transfer story leads from Neil Ashton. Penny pinching Arsenal have made a derisory 40 million bid for Wil- Wilfred Zaha with Argus style payments. Over five years! Five years is all in capitals, in case you don't realise that that's unusual. Crystal Palace, who rate their star man at an eye-watering 120 million, laughed off the measly offer and labelled the Gunners' efforts embarrassing. Incredibly, cheeky Arsenal also demanded a hefty discount, in capitals and bold, if they managed to cobble together the cash to pay off bits of Zaha's transfer fee early. I'd say a stage payment plan is exactly how most transfers are done. I like the vast majority of them. Yeah, they, they, I would say a lot of them are as well, but the, what's the instalment on that? What, what's he mentioning there? I'm, I'm not, five I'm not years, quite sure. Five years, 40 million over like, five years. Come on, five years. Is really every transfer done over five years most for 40 be. million? Well, mo- yeah, most you don't. Well, because it's just a carousel of cash. Who has 40 million in cash in one day to give to somebody else? It's a lot of money, it's a lot of actual money. Whereas you get on the... And then... If you buy Zaha for 40 million, you can uh, amortize him over a similar period. So his value gets down to nothing, which is, in Arsenal's case, very important because obviously they want people to tie him down to a second contract because no one's going to sign a second contract with Arsenal, as we've seen. Uh, and so it's just a financial thing. But, I mean, obviously Palace are leaking this now because maybe they're going to sell Zaha. Is that what's happening? I'm not sure if it's Palace leaking it as much as perhaps Wilfred Zaha's brothers who want him to go and who want him to leave, to go to Arsenal, and they've been on the record. One of them in particular is saying that they hope Crystal Palace actually just sell and actually get on with this and allow him to fulfil his dreams. The thing is, £40 million is not going to be able to prize Wilfred Zaha away from Crystal Palace. A, they don't need the money anymore after signing Aaron wan for £50 million quid. B, they will value him at way more than £40 million because, as I just mentioned, they sold Aaron wan for £50 million quid. They value him at £100 million, which in my view is a little bit ludicrous for a player like Wilfred Zaha. He will improve and his statistics will go up playing for a better team. As bad as Arsenal are, they're a better team than Crystal Palace, I think we're, we're safe to say. But Arsenal are in a sorry state at the moment. Being able to actually afford Wilfred Zaha at a higher price is just not going to happen for them. £40 million quid is breaking the bank for Arsenal when it comes to this transfer window. So don't buy, don't buy young English players. Go off and shop around the world. Do the thing right. that made you great in the first place. Use a scouting network. Sign some players who are undervalued. Like, you know, there's a guy who Bayern Munich signed from. Was it? Was it? Was it? Borussia. Who, who was this guy? Gnabry. I mean, he might. He's a good guy. Check out him. He might be decent in the future. He might be good. A hey, Arsenal. What do you think of that? Mm. Yeah, that's a particular salt in the wound. To be quite honest with you. I don't know, it's, you like, there's been a lot written over the last couple of days, but you're right, there are so many other options around the continent that might be better value, that would definitely be better value than Wilfred Zaha. The thing is, you're getting, I guess, a tried and trusted Premier League talent in Wilfred Zaha, you're getting somebody who will help commercially, or that actually gives the illusion that Arsenal are making big money signings. I mean, you go out and, say for, say for example, if Serge Gnabry didn't play for Arsenal at one point in the past, or if he played for a lesser Bundesliga team, and he's just as good as Wilfred Zaha, and you sign him from a middle-tier Bundesliga team, people will be like, who the hell is this guy? He might be just as effective as Wilfred Zaha, and their transfer dealings look tame and meek and not actually that ambitious. Whereas Wilfred Zaha, if, they, if Arsenal suddenly stump up with £50 million and they sign Wilfred Zaha next week, people will be like, well done on being ambitious. But how effective will he be in reality? It was Kieran Cunningham who, at the weekend, was talking about, um, if you Google Andy Robertson ambition, you see when Liverpool signed him, the Liverpool fans were all like, ah, this is a complete lack of ambition signing this guy who can't even get that much game time for Hull, who's been relegated. Anyway, he's Scottish. What the hell? It's only eight million. But like, what is ambition? The ambition is taking somebody like Andy Robertson and turning him into a world-class superstar. Well, the ambition is to be a better team than your finances allow, and you're up against Manchester City, and you're up against other teams who have loads of money, so you need to shop differently, and you need to shop better, and you need to shop with brains, and signing Wilfred Zaha for whatever amount of money is, it's like, that's not really going to work for Arsenal. No, 
Not anymore. Unless, unless he actually is going to become uh, a player who takes the leap from his quality now to the type of quality that we see from Mo Salah. Like if that's what, if Arsenal really believe he's Mo Salah and waiting, then by all means go for it and spend the 50 million. But he needs to reach that level if you're going to start shopping in England with established Premier League players. Otherwise, you've got to go. So Spurs are signing some midfielder for 75 million who Leon bought last year for eight. In Dombele, yeah. They need to get the, they need to get in Dombele when he's eight million. And that's what Arsenal, that's what made them great in the first place. It was signing players from the reserve team or the subs bench of other teams or players who had bust. And like, Wenger's genius wasn't recognising uh, uh, great talent that nobody else could spot. It was seeing great talent that just was underperforming and paying okay amounts of money for it. Like, Vieira was on the bench in AC Milan and became the best English midfielder of his generation or at least as good as Roy Keane. And um, they're, they're not doing that now. Like, Wilfred Zaha is not this hidden gem who nobody knows about. Everybody's seen his performances week in, week out. All the information is available on him. You need to be signing the next guys who are a bit behind him if you want to turn that club back into something that has the potential to be a top four team. Sure, like Swiss Ramble on Twitter has some very depressing statistics from an Arsenal perspective about 24 hours ago on his Twitter page. Just talking about how Arsenal were in that position not uh, seven years ago, where they were able to go toe-to-toe with most of the big teams in England, with pretty much every team in England in terms of their actual profit, in terms of their spending power, and now that has been diminished hugely. So it's kind of really contradictory that they're going out and actually making this sort of spending. I do feel, though, that we're almost at the cap here. The brothers of Wilfred Zaha might suggest that Arsenal should just push it up a little bit and Crystal Palace might accept that offer. But really, after the Wan-Bissaka money, they're not, if Zaha is semi-interested in playing for Crystal Palace next year, they'll be able to keep him. The only thing is, if he kicks up a massive fuss, this is going to go on and on and on because of the African Cup of Nations and Ivory Coast involvement. So you'll see this, like Zaha, ha, 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 maybe tab of the morning this morning, and it could be the best headline we see on this for weeks. People, the, sub, the sub-editors of every newspaper need to get working on their Zaha puns right now because we're going to have this for the next few weeks. Uh, back page of the Irish Daily Star is Frank's a million, 50 million euro for Lamps in three-year deal at Chelsea. You've got the Wexford cohort celebrating their homecoming after winning the Leinster Hurling Championship uh, at the weekend. And Limerick set for Western Showdown. Mayo and Galway failed to agree on a coin toss for home advantage ahead of their clash in the qualifiers this weekend. If you are James Horn or if you're Kevin Walsh and a coin is put in front of you and you're like, lads, Salt Hill or Castlebar, toss that coin. Do you do it? Uh, Mayo's record in Castle Bar is what three defeats in nine games now, um, nine championship games in the last couple of seasons. So I was like, nah. I, don't, I mean, I'm happy to beat you in Salt Hill. Or actually, so you you, you do toss the coin then? I don't know. I'm, I'm. You're going for Gaelic rounds? Yeah. I mean, fair enough. No, I was, I was just I was just wondering. I was like, when that came up yesterday, I was like, imagine that you get knocked out of the championship away from home, and it was all down to the toss of a coin people everywhere will blame you for actually getting your team knocked out of the championship. It would be a huge stake, so I can see why they, they settled for the neutral venue. Uh, also, they know Limerick better now. It's like it's basically a home ground after... The sure, they got a draw night. against the All-Ireland champions there. After the it's a great result for them in 2014. Semi-final replay, no? That's what I mean, yeah. They've, they've got a fantastic record there, unbeaten after normal time. Yeah, so after extra time... Well, they lost to the All-Ireland champions after extra time. It was a very good result for the team that would want to be known as the best team to never win in All-Ireland. Right, uh, good, good patronisation there. Never let it stop. Don't sleep on the patronising opportunity. Uh, Lyon Hearts. It's uh, li- Lion Hearts. Lyon. Lyon. Um, the Lioness's nickname is also a lot of nonsense. But anyway, uh, Trophy Chasing England can test the favourites in showdown with USA. So, a nil all draw. Is that what we're saying? <coughs> Penalties? That England's best hope? Would that bring glory to your American loving heart, seeing than beat the English on penalties. Is that the way you want it to happen tonight? I don't just, just beat them. It's World Cup semi-final. No one remembers semi-finals. No, no, no prizes given out in semi-final. We're just keeping the head down, doing the work, wor- worrying about the next game, not, not even thinking about the final. Just again, I'm just worried about what hotel I'm staying in for the final. Mm. Uh, why patience is, with the Curra is wearing thin. David Jennings says the revamped home of flat racing needs to start getting it right and soon. So uh, more controversy about the uh, Curra at the weekend at the Derby and um, strong stuff here from David Jennings in the Racing Post. The Curra is the joke that keeps on giving, but the laughing has to stop. The bloopers read that the Curra already has enough content. Now the laughing simply has to stop. 
the Sunday of Irish Champions Weekend, the next big test for the track has now become the biggest day in Irish racing for decades. A parade ring not big enough for horses to parade around, an owner's lounge not big enough for owners, a grandstand which cost millions more than it was supposed to, the roof of that grandstand making a mysterious whistling noise that frightened the living daylights out of kids and guineas weekend, a crowd of 2,859 for the first day of the big three-day Irish Derby Festival, only 802 more to see a group one the following day, and that's just the first paragraph, so um, certainly the issues around the car aren't going away at the moment, and uh, the racing post going hard and heavy at it today. A couple of leads on the tennis yesterday. The Guardian goes with teenager eclipses Venus, 15-year-old Corey Goff, the youngest ever player to qualify for the main draw at Wimbledon, pulled off one of the greatest opening day shocks to beat Venus Williams. And the moment of truth, Neville Glory is in our grasp. Just want to move quickly on uh, to the Daily Telegraph before we bring you an exclusive game that we've formalised uh, for this morning's OTBAM. It is also uh, Sweet 15. Teenage qualifier Goff stuns five-time champion Williams and does to become the greatest. Before we get on to that, just to go through a couple of the quotes here. I'm not sure that you see her interviews in the immediate aftermath of beating Venus yesterday, but they're incredible. Some of her lines, she was like, I want to be the greatest. My dad told me that I could do this when I was eight. You just have to say things. If I'd gone into this match saying, let's see how many games I can get against her, then I most definitely would not have won. My dream was to win and that's what happened. I think people limit themselves too much. I like to shoot high. She also said that her Twitter following would multiply by several numbers over the next couple of days. I didn't realise as well that this has sort of been a talent that's been looked after in the best possible way in a great academy in Florida. And she's also been signed up to Tony Godsick, which is Federer's agent, since she was 13. And she even has a deal with the same pasta company as Roger Federer. Uh, so it's incredible stuff uh, from the 15-year-olds. And I said we'd have to play a brand new quiz show, uh, focusing on the idea of which uh, is older, Corey Goff or these certain things. So do you want to play the game, Ger? Yeah, let's do it. We've got seven things. And uh, I'm sure we'll have the music coming in just a moment to bring the tension. <laughs> Oh, there we go. That's right. How tense is this? Which is older, Corey Goff or Cork's weight for an All Ireland senior hurling title? Corey Goff. Correct. Born in 2004, Cork, 2005, their last All Ireland senior hurling title. Which is older, Corey Goff or the UK office? The UK office. Correct. Two from two. Corey Goff or Ireland smoking ban? Ireland smoking ban. No, Corey Goff. She was born 16 days ah, come on. before smokers weren't allowed indoors in Irish pubs. Corey Goff. When was she born? I'm not allowed to tell you that just yet. She's 15. You, okay, you can say, you can. No, she's, I'm not going to give you the exact month or exact date. Well, Corey come on, Goff. Uh, come on, you can give me the exact date. That, that would okay, be Mar March 13th, 2004. March 13th, 2004. Corey Goff or Shrek 2? Corey Goff. Correct. Shrek 2 is May 15. Corey Goff or the iPod Mini? Ooh, which is iPod older? Mini. iPod Mini. Gonna say the iPod Mini. Correct. Jeez, you're good at this game. These are too easy. Just two more. These are not easy. This is taking every last bit of my tired brain to work out. Corey Goff. Screw you, I'm just because I'm good at it. Corey Goff or Roger Federer's first Grand Slam? Uh, Roger Federer's first Grand Slam. What age is Federer? He's like. Um, 37, so is he gonna go Corey Goff because it was Wimbledon? No. Oh, shit. Uh, Federer, 2003. All right. So, uh, yeah, the second one was 2004. And then finally, which is older. See, this is why I didn't want to give you the date. Uh, Corey Goff or Keen O'Connor's gold medal? Uh, well, Keen O'Connor was the summertime. Well, exactly, so Corey Goff. So, there you go. kind of ruined that last one, didn't you? Well, uh, yeah. Five I mean, from seven, not a bad result. Well done on the first ever and uh, probably last edition of Corey Goff or X, which is older. Great name. I mean, it works. Yeah. You could probably get a better name for it. Didn't have time this morning. That's all right. Uh, Mars, wait, this is a story. I don't know if you talked about this at all on yesterday's show or if it was uh, talked about much, but um, Tipstar could face ban for Casey Lunge. Tipperary defender Ronan Mar faces an anxious wait as Croke Park Central Competitions Control Committee, the CCCC, is expected to review footage of an incident in his team's most final defeat to Limerick. Uh, this was an egregious straight red card, one of the most obvious straight red cards you're going to see in a hurling match. And I realised that... Um, the, mostly the refereeing of the hurling was fairly like, I'm going to get out of the way here, lads, do what you want. And that's absolutely fine. I think everybody wants it like that. But when Ron Amar lifts the elbow, 
He's got to go. And I don't think anybody's going to complain about that. I don't think Tiff fans are like, oh, no, you can't. This is a witch hunt against him. It's like, he should have been sent off. He needs to face a ban for this. Because otherwise, otherwise, all the stuff they talked about head injuries at the start of the year was nonsense. You can't have head injuries being a thing. I mean, there was a couple of other bits where um, uh, Wexford were coming out with the ball and the Kilkenny man was down. And uh, the referee called it back. And this is at the very end of the game. And it ended up being a throw-in. I was like, hang on a second now. Because it, it must have, the only way it could have happened was because it was a head injury. And uh, who was talking about this? Were you guys talking about this yesterday's show? Eamon we were. Yeah, Eamon Fitzmaurice was talking on about Saturday. Kieran McGinney in his post-match comments that very day. These were talking Mayo. Yeah. Being great at using head injuries as a means of stopping play. Yeah, but Fitzmaurice was talking about Mayo and their dark arts and how they will use any trick under the sun to ensure that they get the competitive advantage, which is, obviously, if you want to be a high-performing team in Gaelic games these days, there are so many ways to what, circumvent the rules. So what do you do if you're a team in possession? Like, so, uh, the Kilkenny, I might be remembering this wrong, but as far as I remember, the Kilkenny guy goes down, play continues, play continues, play continues, play continues, and then it's a scoring opportunity for Kilkenny, gets blocked down, Wexford are clearing it, and they have possession, and it's near the very end of the game, and it's very key moment. It's a big yeah. turnover. It's Lee Chin in possession. Crowd's gone wild. Referee goes, <laughs> head injury over here. I don't know if it was a head injury or not. And then threw the ball in. Deep, yeah. deep in Wexford territory. And I'm like, what? If they lose this? If they score off this? I, I, I immediately thought that that would have been one of the biggest talking points of the weekend had Wexford not won on Sunday. That was, I don't know what happened there. What was the exact rule? Because if it's a head injury, it needs to be stopped immediately. Play developed for a significant amount of time. I really just did not understand what the referee was doing there. Maybe there was a head injury off screen that perhaps we didn't you see. Could, you could see an injury. I don't know if it was a head injury You didn't know it was he- Okay, no, fair enough. It just looked like so somebody that, that was That has to be what the ref was thinking, but to actually allow it to develop like that. Yeah, but at that point, right, when it's Wexford possession, you can't penalise them no. for having possession, which is what happens. So I don't know about that rule. Unless you go down the soccer way of actually, you know, playing the ball out of play. I see the Dubs were actually booing somebody for not kicking the ball out of play uh, last week, or at least it seemed like that. Um, I don't think we got to the Irish Times. I think it's a final newspaper. It's Kevin McStay leading the way. Uh, defeat in Connacht showdown will cast long shadow, talking about Mayo. I know to hope at the end, though, from Kevin McStay. I think Mayo are going to the All-Ireland. Do you? Yeah. Give me the group. They're going to beat Galway this weekend, I think. And then, then they go to Clarny. Who are you backing in that game? So they've got Galway this week. They've got Armagh, Galway and Kerry in successive weeks. Yeah. And then Donegal the week after or is there a week break? No, Donegal uh, a few weeks later than that. They'll have Donegal and Castle Barra. They will go to Croke Park and play either Clare or Meath. Who are you backing in that game? Who are you backing against Kerry and Clarny? You're backing Mayo in both of those games. I'm they not backing, and, I'm not backing Mayo into the, to Kerry. They will go into the final game in Castle Barra at four points up against Donegal. Ah, Mayo on. are going you back to the All-Ireland final. You don't believe they're going down talk to Kerry to Talk Kerry. to me about Mayo's recent record in Kerry. Extremely good. Talk to me about uh, Mayo's recent record against Kerry in big games. Extremely good. <laughs> there's, there's two weeks of yarring to be done. You're yarring about a fixture that doesn't even exist yet, so we wait for that. Uh, Irish examiner sports, uh, Derek McGrath, despite Harry Munster final, Tip will still be in All-Ireland final. He put his, um, he's nailed his colours to the mast and picked the All-Ireland final for you. He says Tip are going to beat Wexford in a close game, in a classic in a semi-final that'll be full of extra people, so um, I'd, I'd say let's wait and see how, uh, what kind of stead they're in. Well, the key line, can I just go through the key line in Derek McGrath's column? Uh, one just very briefly before we get to Eddie Brennan. The, oh, we can leave it to later. Uh, Kilkenny legend and leash hurling boss Eddie Brennan is uh, going to join us next, but we're going to hear from Dermot Ling on what Sunday's Leinster final meant for Wexford next. The Sport Ireland campus Blanchardstown is the home of Irish sport, not just for our athletes, but for you and the community. Check out our amazing offers for families with kids' camps, sport academies and birthday parties. Or for adults, why not join our gym with a 50-metre pool? Or your club, school, friends can book one of our world-class indoor or outdoor facilities, including our brand new field sport covered pitches. Find out more on nationalsportscampus.ie. I hear you some wire needs a fixin', ma'am. The name's Buzz. On account of my work. No chance. Not all cowboys ride horses. All safe electric registered electrical contractors must give you a certificate of completion that shows their work meets approved standards. Find one nearby on safeelectric.ie. 
Oh, it's a big one, Richie. You know, like I don't know. It's it's very hard as a as a former player in some ways to articulate it. Like when I think when I think about what it means, like I probably think back to when I was younger, when I was when I was going to Crow Park as a young fella, when I was seeing my father, you know, and engrossed in the emotion of it when I was seeing adults around me breaking down crying because DJ Carey took 14 steps and finished us off again in the last minute of the game or to see us and, and, to, and to be starved of victory in those years as a young fella so intensely um, taken with the whole thing to bring that up to 96 and the, the, just the whirlwind experience that that was and to see literally see the bonfires on the road that people had spoken about for years but we had never seen um, and then right up to 2004 to, 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 to be lucky enough to be coming home on the bus um, after beating Offaly and just, just going back to that like thinking about coming into, into, into Gory and the Davey said it there, you, you know, like the, the gift to be able to give people like hope or to make them smile or to, it's a huge thing. Like it's no bigger in Wexford than anywhere else, I think, other than the fact that we don't get to celebrate it as often. And, and what's rare is, is is obviously, yeah, it's it's just, it's more wonderful at times because you don't get as, you, you don't get bored by the celebration of it. We, we, we take this, um, it's huge for us. It's huge for us. And it, it's huge for yeah, that the, the young fella in all of us, you know, it's it's something I, I can't really as as a player. You just yeah, I, I tasted it very very early on, didn't taste anything that even came close to it for a long time. So um, to look back as a former player, it's a, it's a little bit clouded. I think I'd probably look back as a, what it was like as a fourteen or fifteen year old or an eight or a nine year old. The magic of what that was in terms of what the possibilities of of my life was because of it. We're totally changed everything that I would have done. So it's, yeah, it's so significant. Yeah, great stuff from uh, Dermot Ling yesterday speaking with Richie on Off the Ball. Now, I should let you know that we're in partnership with Free Now, we're hosting a very special event on the 4th of July in the Alex Hotel. You can be there too. Guests of the night include Irish legend Paul McGrath, former Irish international Jamie Heaslip, performance coach for the Dublin Herders, Cleon O'Connor, and the former world champion boxer Andy Lee. It's an exclusive off air event, so the only way you can see it is by being there. Tickets are free. You've got to register to show proof on the day, either by printing your tickets or having them uh, downloaded on your smartphone. Check out offthewall.com forward slash events to get your tickets for the event with Free Now Business, getting your business where it needs to be. Now, I'm delighted to say Eddie Brennan, the uh, Leash Manager, is with us. Um, Eddie, before I talk to you about Leash at the weekend, I did want to get your take on uh, what Dermot Ling was just saying there about the importance for Wexford to come through. Obviously, they came through against your own county, but I don't think anybody begrudged Wexford a victory at the weekend. It's been a long time coming and it's an amazing story. Yeah, it is. I think, uh, look, <laughs> aside from the fact that, um, you know, they, they topped my own county, you'd have to say the scenes down what I've seen on, on, on online and on television over the last uh, 24 hours is just phenomenal. Like, you just go, that's what it's all about. And, and you know, Gizzy touched on it there, but the joy and the happiness it brings to people. And you just see that outpouring of, of happiness from, from Wexford people. And, uh it's a the it's it's brilliant. It's it, it's it's what it's all about. It's to the core of it. Um, and most importantly, I think what it is is that there's you know, as you mentioned it there, but the young lad of of being seven or eight or fourteen, they're looking at that. They're looking at their heroes up on a bus and they're saying, look, that's that's where we want to be, and that's sows the seed for the next generation. Yeah, and uh, like Leinster kind of needs everybody to be good over the next while to make that competition as fierce as the competition in Munster is. Ah, it does, yeah. Look, it's 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 something that um, has been was probably needed. I think you know um, I would have spoke with with John Connor and there going back a while ago about the Davy Fitz appointment, and he said it was something kind of left field, something that Wexford needed, something completely different than than maybe what they had done up to that point. Uh, he probably brought a level of organisation and and maybe uh, an entourage with him that the attention to detail was covered in so many ways, um, and it would have been just, I suppose a new level and, and for players I suppose if you see that there's a really really professional setup then you know and you see that this is going somewhere um, it probably means you will give yourself a hell of a lot more to it and, and that's not with respect to any disrespect to a setup like I think if they see someone that's really really organised and really really knows where he's going and has a plan of what he wants to do and you know you just buy into it and uh, 
the bigger benefit really is that Leinster is getting stronger. Yeah, and uh, part of Leinster getting stronger is what's going on with Leash. It was obviously Leash and Westmead that uh, played at the weekend, and you put up a huge score. So you got a, a little bit of a sense of what the Leash hurling community was like. Not quite the same scenes as in Wexford, but uh, I imagine there was quite a bit of uh, a welcome back when you guys actually brought a bit of silverware home. Yeah, I suppose we we didn't have the road blocked anywhere anywhere with with, with fans out on the road. But uh, at the same time, uh, when we landed into the Midlands Park Hotel, there was a very good reception there. A lot of the, I suppose it was a, a, a bit more intimate, really, because it was family and friends uh, of the team, and and that made it very special for them as well when they turned the corner, you know, to see a gang of people waiting for them. Um, so that was that was brilliant for them to to mingle with their family there for the the guts of a uh, couple of hours and uh, go enjoy the night and. Yeah, look, it's 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 again. We're we're, we're probably um, a good bit back the road from where Wexford are right now, but at the same time, uh, you're you're getting you're getting closer to it. You're getting closer to the teams in Leinster, and I suppose it doesn't get any closer than facing off to them all next year. So um, that's the reward. That's the the challenge that's in front of us. And uh, you'd have to say, um, you know, we definitely have you know the ingredients, and we have some good players that are going to be there, but. Um, we definitely have a lot of work to do to, to get up to that standard. You know, the, the, the physicality of that Leinster final and the intensity of it was savage. Yeah, I, I mean, and here's the thing. Like, you can look back at a, a time in recent memory when Wexford didn't have that physicality and that hurling and the tactical nous to take on uh, to take on Kilkenny when you would have been part of Kilkenny teams that actually were, were ripping Wexford apart and those games weren't contests at all. So you can point to recent memory and say... That's where Wexford have gone from this point to this point and actually say to people credibly at least, if we keep going and if everybody in the county gets behind this team, then who knows what could happen in the next five years. I, I, I'll quickly remind you, Ger, when uh, you ran into Skippy Root and Declan Ryan and lads like that, they, they were fairly physical and uh, I'll tell you, we knew about it when you... When you the, the, the trick was to avoid going into contact with those guys <laughs> Uh, they weren't simple, so look, I mean, it was it was always about using your your brain rather than your brawn. But yeah, look, the, the, your point is, is is right on the meat there, Ger. In fairness, um, I think that has to be the challenge that you look at them and say, look, where have they gone from from three years ago to Kilkenny beating them by twenty points in Nolan Park, um, and to turn around and 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 straight from year one they were competitive. And look, you can you can you know I suppose much has been made of of Davy's system and so much so that every time he talks about it, he feels the need to defend it. I think at this stage, look, we know what, what it is. It's, it's a hurling system. But at the end of the day, they execute the basics very, very well too. Uh, their touch, uh, their ability to get heads up and find a man in a better position is really, really good. Physically, I don't think I've ever seen a Wexford team as conditioned and as fit. Um, I think that's the one thing that's the foundation of any Davy setup is that his teams will be fit. But... Um, yeah, that's in a way it's maybe something that you'll hold up on a on a on a on a ledge for the boys to say to the, the leashes of this world, say, Look, lads, you can if you buy into it, but you definitely say, um, you know, you're probably the strength of your squad is something that you really have to, to flesh out over the next year or two if you're going to be competitive. Eddie, you're right when you say that the talk of Davy and his system has been overplayed at this point, that it is sort of archaic to question why anybody would even work a system in a leash performance sport. Like, I'm sure your leash team operates under a system. Uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty orthodox, uh, Owen. So look, it's um, it's um, it's working for us, and look, it's based on I suppose being flexible. I think um, you know you have to adapt to whatever is happening. You know, earlier this year, you know, we played um, Waterford in the league, and by the very the very movements that Waterford made, uh, they gave us an extra man at the back. So we had to try and think of how best to utilise that. Um, as regards, you know, trying to hurt the opposition or what we could do with that. So. I think it's all about being adaptable. If it means that your midfielders have to push into the half-back line just a bit to help out, then so be it and, and, and maybe create the space up the field. But, um, yeah, look, I'm, 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 I suppose the one big thing I targeted with our guys was, was our ability to score. And um, I think we've done that. We have great options up front. And, um, look, I suppose the, the reality is we have a huge test ahead of us on Sunday and that's going to really test where we are. It's, it's, it's exactly that. It's a benchmark of where we are. How do you manage that one week gap? Was it a couple of pints on Sunday night recovery session last night, or, or how do you work it? Uh, yeah, it was a recovery session of sorts, I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah, look, um, I think that that was the one thing that we, you know, we touched on on Sunday night before we 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 indulged ourselves a little bit was that um, 
we had to kind of come out the weekend and do ourselves justice. And yeah, it was a big ask. Yeah, it was going to be a test of, of lads' uh, maturity and everything else. But uh, we're training, we're training um, tonight, and look, we have to we have to get back to the pitch. We have to probably. Um, uh, do a little bit of a flush this evening anyway and uh, try try uh, get the dirty deeds out of the system because um, we have a huge challenge ahead of us on Sunday and it's one that you'd like to have a real go at. Um, Dublin are a serious, serious outfit. Um, I think they they finally, de- you know, they, they delivered this year and got through to the knockout stages of the championship. So we will be under no illusions. They're sitting there for the last two or three weeks getting freshened up and uh, we're going to need to be at our maximum. And it's going to be very difficult. It's, it's a very short turnaround, but it is what it is. Eddie, when you took the job, I mean, obviously, this would have been the target. So fulfilling the target is always a great thing. It's a, a real sense of fulfillment when you set out on a course of action. You, you do the thing you're supposed to do. But when you did take the job, did you think this was possible? Did, like, did you know this team were as good as you've turned them into? Um, uh, yeah, look, it's, I think, I suppose the realism when I said, look, your target has to be to win the championship that you're in. Um, it was only as we went along that we, we discovered that. Like, you know, you say, right, there's definitely potential here. I felt the hurling, I, from what i seen very early, I, I spot the hurling ability was there and, and I would have known of a few or the, the more you know better high-profile players that would have played with Skip and Cup, that would have played with UCDs and Carlo. So you knew there was hurling there. It was just a case to get the, the other stuff right and that was the, the level of work rate and, and the level of, of uh, skill, I suppose their skill level and how to work and how to tackle because um, for me, look, and from what I learned as a player was if the work rate is right, then the hurling takes over after that. So, um, yeah, look, it was it was difficult. I suppose you, look, it wasn't, I suppose, a mad statement to say we were capable of winning the McDonough. You looked at the competition that was there and said, look, all those teams are quite balanced. But, yeah, we have a very good chance of beating them. And I think um, once we, you know, the big one was obviously Offaly and that was the one we targeted. We targeted nothing else, only that match. And, and you know, it's make or break that kind of a match because if you lose you're now in a different mentality facing into a team seven days later. So that was a massive match to, to set us off for the year. Um, from your own perspective, obviously, this totally justifies your decision to get involved. Was it always a thing that you wanted to do to get involved in management? And why did you end up getting the leash job? How did that come about? Uh, <laughs> it's quite funny, this story. It was only literally mentioned in passing by a guy I knew when I lived up there. Um, you know, and he just kind of mentioned to me, he said, look, there's, there's lads on the hunt for the, the leash management, would you be interested? And I said, yeah, sure, look, I kind of, yeah, casually said, yeah, I would. And then I got a phone call off one of the, the committee guys and it was then that you kind of go, okay, will you give me a couple of days to think about it? And um, there was obviously one or two other guys in, in, in the mix as well. So you kind of had to sit down at home and see what the situation was there and say, look, can, can we manage it? And you know, it appeals to me, I suppose, in a way is that I, I lived up there for a good few years. So I had a bit of a, a knowledge of, of, of the ins and outs of it and, uh, you know, what, what was entailed. And I knew there was, there was definitely hurting ability up there. You know, I thought Cheddar Plunk had done a really good job with him a couple of years ago and, and had them really, really competitive. So you felt that, look, the, the, there's definitely talent there. And, and I suppose for myself as well, it was a case of saying, right, can I, can I do something with these lads? Can I, you know turn it around they're, they're they're in a really difficult tough p- position at the moment and maybe maybe we can um you know do something to get them going at what point in your hurling career did you start thinking about the game in a way that might be conducive to being a good coach because obviously the punditry and the coaching aren't too dissimilar in terms of how you think about a game was it late in your career was it early on that you were like right i get this and i could potentially be good at it um, yeah, I suppose it was, um, you know, I, I gave a year with a junior club in Kilkenny there back in 2013, uh, Liz Downey there, and we won the junior club and myself and I was coaching and Martin Power was managing a former Watford footballer and uh, I suppose I just dipped the toes really at that point in time and, you know, I had ideas of, of what I wanted to do and, um, you know, wh- how I'd like a team to set up and, and I suppose myself, I, I would have generally, you know, as a player, maybe I had to use my brain a little bit more when I was playing. Um, um, so in that regard, you were kind of going, OK, um, can I transfer that now to, we'll say, a team? Can you get them to, to think smart? And that to me would have been one of my philosophies, I suppose, as regards Hurland. Look, there was what you learned from being exposed to a system under Brian Cody and, and, and his I suppose ideas but then it was to obviously marry them off with your own philosophy and, and, and me always would have been about playing smart and doing the simple things well and, and, and always give the ball to the man in the right position And so I suppose at that time you kind of went yeah okay it, it worked this year the boys bought into it 
And I suppose, you know, based on even my background down the, in the Garda College too, you're, you're, you're doing a bit of instructing. So you're conscious of how guys learn and, and say, look, can you transfer that? And, and I suppose, you know, use that to say you help guys learn and, and help guys on the pitch. That's interesting. So what you're saying there, it, the idea that a certain type of player makes a good coach actually isn't that untrue because you had to think a little bit more on the pitch. That type of player helped you become the coach that you are now and the coach that hopefully you'll continue to be over the next few years. Yeah, hopefully. I, I, I think it's, it, it's an essential. I think for any, any player, I think if, you know, you'd, I suppose any player that maybe don't think about it enough, but I would have thought about it a hell of a lot. James McGarry, you know, said to us in 2007 about playing matches over in your head in the run-up to them, that that's how you kind of psychologically prepare yourself. And the very technical term is is a visualisation. And, and we see that with a lot of top sports people. So, you know, for me, in the build-up to matches, you, you just thought through the scenarios you were going to encounter. So you, you kind of picture them in your head and how you're going to deal with them. And for me, that was very important because I could spend 20 minutes inside in the corner and I was that type of player. If the ball wasn't coming into me, I got very anxious. And as a result, then you get kind of, you, you get heavy touches and stuff. So, it was just being at ease with that, but uh, definitely from the from the perspective of um, you know playing smart, um, it's something that I think all players have to do now. If 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 your if your game face or your critical thinking isn't on during a match when the pressure is high and you're not doing that in training week in week out, it's very very difficult to go to somewhere like Croke Park or the big stadiums and perform. I don't know if you've had a chance to uh, check out the Examiner today yet, but uh, Derek McGrath has a piece where he's uh, very highly. Um, complimentary of, of you as a manager. Very much in evidence was the evolution of Eddie Brennan as a manager at the weekend. He now realises the teams can be tactically fluid without being hamstrung by over-instruction, the perfect mix that we all strive for. And he, he's got loads of stuff about um, Mark Cavanaugh as well. Uh, high praise from, um, from Derek McGrath, who obviously is a very deep thinker of the game. I, is he right that, about that? About like You want your team to play with tactical instruction, but also to be quite free when an opportunity arises. So, you know, there's a, a balance to be struck between playing in a system and being locked into that system. Ah, definitely, yeah. I think, um, look, at the end of the day, it's, it's when the players get on the pitch, I think they have to be able to think and they have to be make, able to make decisions on the pitch. And, and part of our instruction, look, we, we, I suppose we kept things very, very basic during the year and, and central to that too. Look, I had Niall Corcoran there with me from former Dublin player who was you know, the, our head coach, and he was really, really good. Um, I think the players bought into to his messages as well, and, and Tommy Fitz and Fran as well. But um, I think we, we, we think we, when we spoke initially and I met with Niall, we, we were on the same wavelength. And I just, one of the key things I felt, you know, and, and at times I would have felt, if I'm being self critical here, I would have felt I could be over uh, giving guys maybe a little bit too much information. So, so that was something we zoned in on saying we give lads very, very basic instructions, simple instructions. And give them the freedom to say, look, that's, it might take us five or six minutes to adjust to a tactical move from the other team. But that's where we want you to, to box it off yourselves on the pitch. If you see that they have a man drop back, communicate that around. Or we, we, we now go up the wings. Or, you know, you have to say, well, there's no point in making a hero of that man. And that's just one example of it. You're saying, look, if, if we find our backs are being pulled apart a little bit, well, our midfielders might have to drop another five or ten yards just to help out with that. And our, half, our wing forwards then have space in front of them. So... Like you said there, you know what? It's it's nice to hear that, but um, I suppose it's a very very simplified version. And I think you, you give players a very very basic grasp of what you need them to do. And if they focus on the core stuff, you're not overcomplicating it. And uh, I think you have to realize that the players are the ones on the pitch doing the doing the executing. They're the ones that when it crosses the lines, they're the ones that are hurling. So they have to be very very clear in what they're about. And and there is a freedom to 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 sort it out themselves on the pitch. Eddie, best of luck with the weekend and congratulations on the first trophy. Thanks a million. Thanks a million, guys. All the best. Eddie Brennan there, the uh, Leash manager, giving us some reaction after uh, Leash picked up their silverware and will play uh, against Dublin Import Leash, part of the double header with the Mead Clare game at the weekend. It's brilliant to see. I mean, is this sort of a, a statement of what could possibly be? I hate to bring it back to football, but with a Tier 2 competition down the line, it's the idea that, of course, they're back in uh, the Liam McCarthy is a huge thing for them, and maybe that's where every team wants to be, and potentially there will be <coughs> a rolling out of a bigger Leinster Championship in years to come, but winning a Joe McDonough Cup is a big deal. It's been a, br it's been a brilliant competition. There could be more done in terms of televising more games and more promotion of it, but I don't know, it's, it's been pretty positive to me. It's 23 minutes past 8 this morning on OTBAM. If you want to get in touch with us, you can use the hashtag OTBAM. Ron Lagar is up next. Uh, Jamie Cudmore joined Neil Tracy on the latest episode of Land of the Rising Scrum as we focus in on Canada ahead of the 2019 Rugby World Cup. Have a look. 
you have been quite active in the fight, you know, preventing concussions and clamping down on head injuries since your retirement. You had a... Uh, you know, you ended up having to take legal action against Claremont over the way they would have put you back out onto the pitch after suffering a concussion in 2015. But, like, are you still feeling the effects of that even a few years on? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, there's uh, been problems with uh, with speech, uh, definitely memory problems. Um, is that linked to those uh, those incidents in uh, in 2015? Maybe. Are they linked to other incidents that's happened in the past? Uh, that could be the truth as well. Um, the problem with uh, any type of brain injury is, is nobody can really tell exactly when or how or how much time it takes to recover. But um, definitely in those, in those uh, two weeks during the, the semifinal and the final of the European Cup uh, back in uh, I can, uh, a few years ago that um, you know I was I was put through the ringer and uh, basically spat out the other side and the club uh, basically got rid of me the following year but um, you know unfortunately uh, guys uh, guys need to stand up for themselves when uh, when they get um, treated like a piece of meat and uh, and that's kind of where we're at now. Uh, that's uh, Jim Cudmore there speaking with Neil on Land of the Rising Crumb. You can uh, search that on YouTube and you'll get our whole series. We're uh, counting down the rugby stories of all of the teams who are in the Rugby World Cup with Neil every week on Land of the Rising Scrum. Let's move on because we want to talk about the uh, Super Rugby final. It is the Crusaders against Jaguares this weekend and Ron Nogara is with us to talk about that. Ronan, good morning to you. How are you doing? Hey, Jar. How are you? I'm good, yeah. Did you like my Spanish pronunciation hey, of Jaguares? I did. Very impressive. There you go. Uh, how, are you, how are you guys preparing for them this weekend? Well, it's like playing Argentina, I suppose. Um, so a lot of the All Blacks in our squad have familiarity with that. We haven't played them yet this season, which is a little bit strange. We played them in Argentina last season, but um, they arrived to Christchurch today. So uh, a long flight and um, obviously different time zones. So, um, you know, I think when they got the quarterfinal, they seemed that... Um, they were happy, and then the demolition they did the Brumbies in, se in the semi final. They're dangerous, obviously. They've won ten of their last eleven games, so it's um, it's um, obviously a dangerous uh, a dangerous team to come up against. But um, I suppose in Crusader style, we're focusing on ourselves a little bit as well. Um, not to labour the point too much in the yeah. the Argentinian team, but do they play a little bit like the team in the last World Cup, with um, quite happy to fling the ball around? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they're, um, they're really, really uh, exciting counter-attack team. So, uh, you know, Casada has gone in there this year and they, they, he's made a big difference. I feel they're really playing for him and um, they've been deadly on the on the counter-attack. I think they've scored 20 tries from um, inside their own half, you know, or inside maybe their own um, 22. Some staggering statistic like that, which which makes them very dangerous. Their skill level is high and... Um, as we found out in Cardiff that day, um, when they click, they are um, a mean proposition for any uh, any outfit, especially at test level. But this is club level. The um, the your own semi final was uh, an incredibly tense, tight affair. A thirty twenty six win against the Hurricanes. Um, I, I, did you feel comfortable at any point during no. that game? No, it was horrible. It was it was. Um, usually, when you don't put away a team, it comes back to bite bite you. And I think. Uh, live in the box if they had scored off the last play they would have deserved it uh, that was my gut instinct then I reviewed the game and um, I think we had four opportunities from seven metres or less between the 20th and the 33rd minute where we could have scored a try which would have made it 17 nil um, or nearly 20 nil so it's a complete different game and at half time after 39 minutes we were 13 nil up and it makes for a different team talk when it's 13 nil, and then all of a sudden they score the last play of the game, 13-7, and they haven't really been in the game, and you're like, uh, how do I get the boys up here when we dominated the game, yet we're six points up, and then uh, two minutes into the second half, um, a bit of magic from TJ Perinara, put Ben Lam away down the blind side, and um, Bodhi Barrett has a conversion to, for them to go ahead, and you're like, oh, we've been controlling this game, but we're not ahead in the scoreboard. So it, it was really... Um, Difficult with some great attacking skills and show. Uh, Jar, we probably were a little bit disappointed with our defence, um, but uh, the weather was very um, well, uh, strange for this time of year. It was dry ball the last three games we've had, so it's kind of summer rugby at a winter time. Uh, a lot of dew, but the boys' skill levels are good that they still play ball. 
when you're the dominant team in a game but the scoreline isn't reflecting that, Ronan, how tempting is it to sort of abandon the process a little bit and not actually stick to what you're there to do and stick to the game plan? Um, I don't think I was probably thinking like that. When I was more like... Um, with the Hurricanes, they have some deadly individuals, you know, like if you give Bowden Barrett space, uh, as, as you know, he's... He's electric and TJ Pernar is in the form of his life. But we we, uh, we worked, like, for 39 minutes, we were really, really good. But we just, you know what I mean? Even at 13 nil, you would be very happy. But 13-7 is very different. And, and they really maximised, I suppose, their opportunities to score. So, um, no, there isn't fellas tearing off script, to be honest. I think it just, uh, we are quite structured. But within the structure, there's a, there's a fair bit of flexibility to trust our instincts as well. When you say you're watching that and it's a horrible feeling, I presume that horrible feeling is way worse as somebody who's not on the pitch these days, somebody who's as a coach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, you just you're in the box and you kind of go eight points up and you just position your book so you can get a, a drink of water or and uh, get something off the laptop, um, and then all of a sudden, like so, I think off three of times we scored off kickoffs within two minutes they had scored. So an eight point game, you have a little bit of breathing space and you can breathe a bit. And then uh, all of a sudden it's back to one score and you're like, oh no, you know? Brennan, the, you, the team are going for um, a three in a row. In, in any sport, it's unbelievably difficult to stay at the top and to do it twice back to back suggests they're a great team. To do it three times would be like an all-time great team. Does it, do you talk about that to the team? Is that part of the conversations or how do you address any of that kind of thing? Yeah, it is. And I think you're right. You've been around sport a long time. It, it is extremely difficult to do. And some people that maybe aren't that tuned in will think, well, maybe they don't have that much competition. It's so competitive. It's so difficult to, to I wouldn't say maintain the focus, but to, to do what those boys are doing. I think it's really admirable and it's great to be part of it. And, uh, you know what I mean? It all goes on the line now on Saturday night again, because if you don't get the performance, you won't get the results. So, but, um, you know, I wasn't there for the first of them, but if they were to, last year was special, but this year, as you know, to def, uh, kind of go on and do a three-peat um, would be uh, extra special. But it's, I think that's that's the beauty of, of, of Scott Robertson. I think so much of his, um, of it is down to his mindset and how he kind of uh, drives it with his culture and with its seeming. So uh, in that regard, uh, we look into a lot of other sports and we look into, we uh, kind of gather inspiration from what other uh, people have done and teams have done around the world and uh, it makes for such an enjoyable week that um, it's a great place to go to. Because well, uh, teams like that who come through a very difficult semi-final, there's some reservoir of some knowledge deep in a champion team that lets them get out of a sticky semi-final situation like the one you've come through. Would they have been able to do that if they weren't champions? Um... It's a great question. I don't know, genuinely, because the margins, when people talk about margins in sport, it could so easily be us on holidays on Monday, Jar, and the Hurricanes going on to play a final. That's, that's the tiny margins you're talking about. And 80 minutes to a lot of people seems like a long time in sport, but this was like, uh, you know what I mean, shootout, and any error was punished greatly. And uh, we just came out on the right side of a one-score game. But it could have been... Uh, it could have been over and it would have been such a hammer blow uh, because it's only when it's gone you realise what you're leaving behind. It's not 80 minutes, it's the whole season and it's it's uh, a dynasty at this stage for what the Crusaders are doing. So um, I think definitely uh, we're very lucky in the fact that we have uh, double World Cup champions. I wouldn't underestimate what that does for people around them. Yeah, I guess that was, sorry, my question was a little bit, uh, was the difference between you and the Hurricanes in retrospect the fact that you, you guys have that winning bank? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 would, I would think so. You know, I just think that uh, it's only when you get on or when you winning becomes your norm and it becomes a habit, you know what that tastes like. And I think um, we were disappointed, as I said, with some aspects of our game, but uh, the capacity to, to find a way to win when you're not... Um, I suppose firing on all cylinders uh, speaks volumes for the, I suppose, the mentality of, of a lot of the players. When you say you're looking at examples from other sports, Ronan, do you specifically mean other sports teams that have gone on to be defending champions successfully? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. In all different codes of sports and um, 
it's obviously not 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 allowed. I'm not allowed to talk about it publicly because it's it's one of the golden rules with the theming with with the Crusaders that it's it's kept as a secret. But it's 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 fascinating stuff. On but yeah, I, you know I think it's not uh, breaking any protocol by by looking at different sports and and teams and individuals that have gone on to I suppose excelled a number of times um, and uh, create. Uh, such a great, I suppose, winning um, culture. Is there, I'm not sure how much you can go into, is there a common thread at all between these uh, unspecific examples? Um, oh yeah, there is, yeah, you're fishing nicely here. <laughs> 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 uh, there is, of course, yeah, but um, one, of the, one of the teams didn't go on to do the business, so they were quickly <laughs> dropped. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't many more videos of them. <laughs> Uh, here well, we have. It's great. It's a great motivation tool for players. You know, sometimes um, I think what you learn sometimes as that player is that you get sick of a coach's rant. But sometimes videos can be very powerful. So watching that is um, is very very powerful. I think really gets uh, gets inside a player's head sometimes better than words. Pictures are better than words at times. Um, uh, we haven't. I haven't talked to you yet since uh, La Rochelle move was confirmed. Um, Adrian Barry is actually on his holidays in La Rochelle this week, so if you need anybody to do any house hunting for you, I'm sure he takes. La Rochelle call. or Ile de Ré? Oh, he's he's in a bit of both actually. He's doing both. So okay. are you, is Ile de Ré where you're heading? Uh, all roads point there. Yeah, Jerry. I think it's a good place to live. So I was it's there amazing. holidays actually a few years ago, but. Um, yeah, it would be good for the triathlon training, I think. Maybe we could get a, an off-the-ball team going out there and um, training camp. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome. That you sounds great. And is, that Im- is that important, though? When So when you get a phone call from La Rochelle and you're like, actually, I know that part of the world, and it is pretty nice, and it would be a nice thing yeah, to do. Yeah, of course it is. As I said, you're like... The playing days obviously are over and the sacrifices Jessica's made and with the kids and the schooling, uh, there has to be a sell for them to, to be excited to go to play. So Ile de Ray is a beautiful place and um, that's that's where we'll go and live, yeah. Obviously, you know, you haven't thought too much, I presume, about what that culture that you're going to install in that team is going to be like, but it'll be different from the culture. Yeah, it'll be so different. So, But nonetheless... Uh, it could be as exciting as you make it and want it to be. So that's the challenge. But uh, you go there um, next week, um, you know what I mean? Full of full of excitement, really. You know, it's a great challenge and it's something that uh, you want to have a go off. So that's exactly what my mindset is at the minute. And it's that quick. So this weekend you've got the final of Super Rugby and next week you're back in France in this part of the world and the new job starts straight yeah, away. Yeah, I've got to get home as quickly as possible because La Rochelle start training next week and uh, I'll get in, I'll get hit the ground the following week. Right, It's uh, it's been a whirlwind. Have you thought at all about the two two years in in uh, New Zealand? Have you kind of... Not yet, not yet, I think. Hopefully, when I get on the plane with a smile, I'll, I'll think about that, Joe. But as you know, it's that kind of looks after itself when when you um, kind of do the business in terms of just uh, it's so ruthless at this level that you kind of get you keep your foot in the accelerator, and then you when you come up for air, you'll be able to process your thoughts a bit better. I feel. Yeah, well, it's been an amazing adventure. Best of luck this weekend, and thanks a million for talking to us. Yeah, cheers, lads. Great to chat. Thank you. Ron McGar giving us some thoughts. Uh, probably for the last time, we'll talk to him from New Zealand. Pretty amazing adventure. Yeah, the time zone suited us perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody yeah, uh, afraid he, he might. He, I suppose French time just before training. An hour, us. an hour ahead of us. Perfect. Yeah, it's grand. It's grand. It's it's interesting what he says there, and uh, the sort of culture they try to create, and the things they might change, and the little changes that need to happen to actually. Allow that winning culture to continue. Okay, let's, let's idly speculate on what teams he was Chicago talking Bulls. about. I was thinking, definitely thinking Michael Jordan, all right, yeah. Individuals he mentioned. <clears throat> Tiger. Federer. Federer. Well, Why do you is, learn is Nadal Federer? more of an example? Because of the sort of more monotonous nature of his greatness uh, in terms of its specificity to clay. I don't know. I'm not sure. I think... Um, People forget about Federer when he arrived. It was like uh, petulant, giving out to people. Not quite Nick Kyrgios, but like, you know. More Andre Agassi. Dial, dial Nick Kyrgios down to um, John McEnroe level of petulance. 
and he wasn't that bad, was he? No, he was pretty bad though. He like definitely people were thinking, oh, this guy looks like he has the game for it, but you know, does he have the temperament? And then obviously he turned out to have the best temperament of anybody in any sport. Like there's a there's a shout that his achievements are better than anybody else's in any individual sport. There's a shout. Well, he's he's going to be considered there. When you, whenever you have the conversation of the goat. Like Roger Federer is always thrown in with, with the greats. So of course there's a, there's a shout in there as well and it's hard to make any huge argument against Federer. Do you need, do, you, do, you, do they need, like do the Crusaders need to be watching somebody who's got like a, another, another dog story who's come back from something or do they need somebody who is like Michael Jordan? I mean, I'm the best or LeBron, I'm the best. What, like, you know. To, I think they probably do. Game. I think they probably need the latter, don't they? Because well, this is the first time an Argentine side has made the Super Rugby final, so uh, I didn't check the prices on this, but um, you imagine Crusaders are like healthy double, enough favourites. Double digits, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess. So yeah, I think it is a matter, especially when you're going for three, that you do sort of find a way to make that arrogance count, or to find that right balance on the, on the right side of arrogance. Thirteen point favourites. Thirteen point favourites. There you go. So. They need to find a way of channeling that 13-point favoritism into a huge advantage in terms of their psyche, instead of trying to be overly focused on what the opposition is going to bring and how brilliant, in inverted commas, the opposition might be. The Patriots? Because in um, uh, traditionally in American football, one conference was always stronger than the other one, and you would always kind of... Uh, there would be hype before the Super Bowl, but everybody would then, uh, when everything finished, everybody re would realise that actually the real final was the conference game because the Super Bowl ended up being a blowout. And there was like a decade and a half where the Super Bowl was always a blowout, almost never a close game. Um, and so I wonder is it one of those teams who wins a semi final against mortal enemies, teammates at international level, uh, including the best player in the world and Bowden Barrett? Do you then show them videos of like the 49ers crushing the Buffalo Bills or whoever in the finals going, we're the best team. We just, we just won, now we need to go and crush. How do you do it? The solidification of your greatness is sometimes going out and absolutely hawking a team. Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? Mm. It might be. That, that could be the way to do it. I guess the Patriots had a lot of other, and they have a lot of other factors that will drive them on. In, more, in recent times, it is the constant discourse that Tom Brady was finished. He's too old to be a good quarterback in the NFL, never mind a quarterback to, that could lead a team to the Super Bowl. That would be the oxygen beneath them. The constant trades, constant draft in the NFL, the constant changeover of personnel, that surely refreshes the things on a year-by-year -year basis, and it is easier, easier to find that freshness. Then again, when you have a, a certain core of players, which I guess the Patriots have had relatively over, over the last few years, not, not a, a whole spine to be honest, but a, a couple of them, then how do you keep that fresh? But maybe it is the new players coming in, maybe it is them that drive the standards as well and that uh, squad mentality, or maybe it's just a culture around the coach. Maybe Belichick is the real reason why the Patriots are so successful, well, because do all the players, are they all terrified of them? Well, I, I mean, I, yeah, there's probably a significant part of that, probably most of them are terrified of Brady at this stage as well. But like, he's also a genius, so that helps. Like, um, he's got a bigger brain and more knowledge of everything that's ever happened in, in a mathematical sport. Like, he's seen all the equations of the positions on the pitch, so uh, I don't know how transferable those videos are. That just becomes a, the coaches would be really into that. But are your players going to be like, oh man, it's Brady stuff again, Jesus. What are you watching? Well, like, I don't know enough about the Bulls history. They had Michael Jordan. No, everybody else didn't have Michael Jordan. It was like an unfair advantage in that team. Yeah, I guess there was a culture of fear around Michael Jordan as well. But regardless of the culture of fear, I mean, they're, they're, how, how does this apply? How are you applying this? Yeah, it's true. I mean, they don't, they don't have the Michael Jordan to pin their hopes on. They have an extremely excellent bunch of players, but they don't have the Michael Jordan. There is no Michael Jordan at the moment in rugby. There may never be a Michael Jordan in rugby. There never will, actually, there will definitely never be a Michael Jordan in rugby, that's for sure, because it's too big a, a team game to ever allow for one person to dictate on that level. So I don't know how they actually play that. Maybe they don't. Maybe we're completely off the mark here and it's not them whatsoever. Maybe they're looking at the dubs. Uh, go on. Jim, Jim Gavin down, maybe that's why Kieran Kilkenny was down in New Zealand this year, wasn't he? Maybe he was uh, linking up with the, the Crusaders, giving them all the secrets. 
letting the, the lid off on what the Dubs have actually been doing. To be fair, do the, Crusade, do the Crusaders play uh, a Leinster Championship every year that allows them to get set up nicely? I don't think they do. Uh, well, I mean, they get to play the South African teams who aren't, aren't that good anymore. It's, uh, it's kind of a, not exactly the same equivalent, to be quite honest. I don't know. It's uh, yeah. There's, pro- there's probably a lot of things you can look at. I, I think you look at someone like Tiger, really, and that maintenance of excellence, the Federer, and that maintenance of excellence, despite the fact that everybody is pointing at you and telling you you are the best, you are better than everybody else. How do you actually take that and actually allow that to keep the fire burning? Because for me, I just think the Patriots have had a lot of stuff said about them, and they have a, like the flake gate, like the victimization complex that came around that. That's another example of a reason why they were able to to keep their foot down. Which uh, which everybody's given the dubs this year with the constant uh, conversations about everything that's in their favour. It's like, would you not, you know, wait and go, oh, they're the greatest team of all time, it's amazing, and then, like, when they crash they out, their go, belly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, did no one pay any attention to anything ever in sport? Like... <laughs> uh, the bad guy always wins. Well, it's like, you've got too much money, your backroom team is too big, uh, the referees are going too easy on you with the piece of the weekend. Um, you've got too much money. That's not... Like, this is motivating the dubs. Uh, did you want to talk about Derek McGrath a little bit earlier? Oh, well, it's just one observation, very briefly here in his examiner column. The passion of Davy and Wexford's man behind the wire is the headline. And it's a brilliant observation from Derek McGrath here on the pitch. He says, early on in the game, I noticed Mark Fanning, uh, the Wexford goalkeeper, obviously, conversing with someone behind his goal at the Davin stand end. It was intriguing to watch this member of Davy's backroom team perched right in the front row, five yards from Fanning's goals, clearly instructing Fanning regarding the puck out policy. I monitored this individual's progress at half time as he somehow made his way to right behind the goal at the hill, and the guidance duly continued. When you take your seat for the semi final Saturday, three weeks, watch out for this. Nobody else has picked up on this the idea that there was a man wired up part of Davies' backroom team, sitting right behind Fanning, instructing him on his puck-out policy, instructing him when to change it, where to change it, and what to do. And he somehow, well, this is the greatest piece of Houdini acts we've ever seen in Croke Park, getting from the Davin stand to the Hill 16 end without uh, any trouble whatsoever, to be able to get there and do the same thing in the second half. Do you think he has a bib? Do you think he's wearing like one of those um, Stuhor bibs where it's like, ah, oh, no, I'm supposed to be here, yeah, undercover? I mean, he actually might have been because... Derek McGrath doesn't name him. So potentially Derek McGrath doesn't actually know who this is. So he would have had to have some sort of identification. Maybe it was just a little earpiece. And maybe he just noticed that he was the, the, the constant conversation. He obviously noticed the con- constant conversation. So maybe he didn't need to be that identifiable. No, what I mean is to, to smuggle his way from one side of the ground to the other. Oh, sorry. Dressed up as a steward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> potentially. How are you going to do it? You could uh, pay off do, a ball boy to do it. Do you, like you've got to leave and come back in. You could definitely do that. You need a premium ticket because you can walk the whole way around premium. You can't walk around. You can't get over to the hill. You need to exit the ground almost and go into the hill again, don't you? Or there's a little gate between both stands as well. So it's a tough one to do. Or maybe they just cleared it with Croke Park. It's genius. It's something that every team, I'm, I'm well, surprised they, they, yeah. they haven't done it. I know, I'm sure we'll start to see it soon. It's much easier in a provincial ground. Next weekend, now that, now that it's been rumbled by Derek... I'm sure David Fitz reading like, ah, Derek, because you're not away until the end of the season. Yeah. Everybody. I'm actually surprised Derek McGrath isn't someone who's uh, thought of that. He's, he's thought of everything else when it comes to tactics and all of that. So uh, it's, uh, it's another this innovation is, from Davy. This is what Davy Fitz was talking about, obviously, in the aftermath of the game. So this was the interview that he did with uh, Maura Trassa at the weekend where she was talking to him about the tactics and, well, he wasn't giving much away. To me, it looked like, obviously, there was a battle on the field, but there was also a battle of wits again between two managers at the top of their game on the sideline. Today was tactically crazy and people mightn't realise what's going on. There's a lot of stuff going on there today. Even on puck outs, even on other stuff, it was there was a lot of work done and um, it's nice to come out the right side of it. There you go, that's what he was talking about. Even on puck outs, we had a man stationed behind the goals. I mean, no, 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 we didn't. <laughs> that's class. Uh, right, a little bit of subterfuge to uh, sprinkle in in your morning. It's 8.48. Uh, you're listening to us on uh, Go Loud or on OTB Sports Radio or you're watching us on youtube.com forward slash off the ball or on Periscope you can just follow us on Twitter or on Facebook.com we're also live and streaming every morning uh, if you want our 24 hour radio station just get on to offtheball.com forward slash radio uh, and this show every morning is brought to you by Avancard powered by Mastercard On your Gorman is going to join us next first here's Kieran Cunningham on the Sunday paper review talking about how much of a loss Huddersfield bound Colin Bell will be to Irish football there's very little of it on it in the papers like a couple of lines here and there but Colin Bell the woman's manager 
has stepped down. He's moving to work in, on, as part of the background team at Huddersfield yeah. Women's Team in England. But in going, he said it was you know, it was partly related to what's been going on in the FAI yeah. and f f future promises of funding. And this is an indication of what's happened coming down the tracks. You know, with the withdrawal of funding, with uh, sponsors running scared, with th this and all of this stuff isn't going to go away. Like, this story could drag out for a long, long time. So it is going to impact on jobs and on, on, on what's happening at various levels in Irish soccer. And I think we've seen a, a sign of that with Colin Bell, who the w women's players rated really highly. Mm. Like, he has a big loss. So yeah. I think yeah. that's a practical illustration of how messy this is going to get. Anya Gorman is with us now to help us preview the England-USA game this evening. Before we get to that, though, just uh, it would be remiss of me not to ask you about the departure of Colin Bell. Uh, very highly rated by the players is what we're hearing. Was that your experience? Sorry, was that, again? Was that your experience? Um, yeah, like, he came in at a good time, I think I said before, off the back of the stand, stand we made as international players and probably got a lot of resources off the back of that as well. And um, He did have his firmly his own uh, football philosophy as well but I do I honestly think if you look back on the results then um, obviously apart from the, the draw against the Dutch it's it's no more success than, than the previous managers have brought as well so um, while obviously it's really really bad timing for the girls coming up to the European Championship qualifiers uh, that, that's a disappointing factor as well but I think that we just look to have to look ahead now and hopefully the FAI get the right person in to do the job is there an obvious candidate? Because um, there had been some speculation that maybe an internal candidate would get the job and that there was somebody ready to go. Yeah, no, I think it's a hard one to call. I think I said before that they just have to... I think they need to buy their time and, and not just rush into it and make sure they, that they get the right predecessor to take over and, and bring the game forward. And I firmly believe that they, it's a great qualifying campaign and, and the, that Ireland will qualify for the European Championships in England in 21. Yeah, I mean, uh, qualifying for the Euros in England given that it's on our doorstep, given that so many of our best players are actually playing in England, that would be a, 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 the perfect tournament for us to get to. I mean, obviously, any Euros is going to be great, but the ones that are in England, there'll be huge Irish support. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of really important. Yeah, I think so, and it's probably as close to a home tournament there that we have, as a senior women's team, that we'll probably ever get as well. So, yeah, no, I think it's a massive chance and a massive opportunity, and um, uh, hopefully they, that we can make that step now to qualify for the first major tournament and, and then the backing we'll get and the support we'll get and especially off the back of the World Cup as well I think that um, women's football has inherited um, loads of new fans with the, the excellent covers that were to year given on TG Hatter and So Dave Connell is the, is the favourite to get the job is he should they I mean is he ready for that job in your view or should they actually wait and see if there's anybody else out there Yeah like I said I think they just need to buy their time and like you have Ireland Gleeson as well in Ireland who's a pro licence holder too so um they they just have to wait their time and, and make sure to get the right person into the job. Okay, Anya, talk to us a little bit about what you expect to happen in the England USA game. Obviously, uh, the Americans are favourites by virtue of the fact that they've got a much longer tradition of being successful in World Cups than England do. And yet, look, it's a semi final, so pretty much anything could happen. Yeah, anything can happen. And I think, personally, at the minute, teams are probably probably on level par, and England probably have a better have had a better run in the games, and and are probably showing a little bit better form. I think the USA have probably been lucky and a good few of their results um, coming up to, leading up to the semi-finals as well but like the squad both teams have and both teams are going to be fresh enough with the rotation both managers have been, been successfully able to do like you have the front three of the USA Rapino Morgan up front and then you have the combination of Dunn and uh, Rapino down the left side against Paris and, and Bronze down the right side for England which is both probably the two the major strengths of the teams as well so I'm really looking forward to them. I think it's going to be exciting one, and I don't think I can call it. It could easily go to extra time and penalty. On those specific matchups, who's out on top in your view? Sorry, say again. On those specific matchups that you mentioned there, who comes out on top? <sighs> uh, I'm going to go with Bronze and Paris, but I think Paris will have a tough game against Dunn today. Right, it's a big statement because I'd imagine that United States fans are, are looking at uh, the other side of that and saying to themselves, well, we have these here. We have people in those positions who can cause England a lot of problems. But clearly, I guess, when it comes to tournaments, form is such a huge thing and England are bringing piles of it into this game. Yeah, I think so. They're probably the more informed team, I'd, I'd say, than the USA. I think the USA hit the ground running, but since then, have just managed to get, to get the results uh, they needed to get through, to get through the tournament as well. And I think England have probably... 
um, start to peak at the right time as well. And, and there seems to be a great camaraderie in the, in the squad as well. So, like I say, it's a tough one to call. I think it depends on who turns up and, and who fires on the night. There's been plenty written in the English press in particular about the uh, confidence with which the United States carry themselves. They know that they're good, they believe that they're good, and they like to tell the world that they're good. It's refreshing to see, I guess, from a general sports point of view. Uh, what's your view on that? Um, yeah, like I think the United States have been at the top of women's football for a long, long time, and um, like it, it's great to see. And, and they're the num- like they're, the women's team in the United States is more successful than the men's team as well, which is is massive as well, and the support they get. And I think I read a stat yesterday on the jersey sales of their jerseys is, is probably one of the all time in America. So I don't know the exact um, figures on that as well. So, that, so that's massive to see. And I think both teams are very confident. Like England are very confident team, the USA are very confident team, and in their media as well. So uh, it just uh, brings up a good tie. One of the things about um, the build up to this has been about the style of play of the Americans. Um, like, Quite direct, actually, not not kind of um, passing the ball through the midfield, not really looking to to keep possession. I think the uh, possession starts with the semi final against France. France kind of dominated that game, yeah. but um, obviously that's not they're not in the tournament anymore, and the Yanks are, so they're pretty happy with that kind of uh, very direct style of play. Yeah, it seems to be working for for them so far, and it's goals that wins game. That's the only stat that matters at the end of the day, and um, yeah, they are a little bit more direct, and I think. They've probably been lucky, like I said, with a few results and a few penalty decisions as well um, to get them through. But um, that's just the winning mentality they have amongst them. But um, yeah, England will probably play play a little bit more football than the USA. But I think they just look to get the, the ball up to their forward players that do the danger as quick as they can. Um, in, in terms of your own career, Anya, you, you stepped away, I think, yeah. uh, quite young from the international setup, despite the fact you had already got 100 caps by the time you were 29. So um, would you be tempted to go back to international football? Um, yes, yeah, so I would be tempted. Um, I suppose I have to see what happens. But if I'm playing well and, and whoever comes in as manager picks me, um, I'd have to strongly consider it. Yes. Okay, right. Does that suggest there was an issue with Colin? Uh, that it was it was him that was one of the reasons why you stepped away? No, no. I think I, I was just I've been playing for a long time and had a massive commitment now, and I probably I've obviously I took a step back as well, and and looking at the World Cup and stuff like that probably just gives you a little bit of hunger, but. Like I said, we'll just see what happens and, and who comes in to take over. Okay, so you're, you're keeping your options open. Yeah, that's it. All right, fair enough. Anya, thanks for joining us this morning. Cheers. No worries. Talk to you soon. That's Bye. Anya Gorman giving us some thoughts on the semi final tonight. The, um, the Americans are 6 to 5 on, England 16 to 5. So England is bigger than 3 to 1 to win this game tonight. It's massive. Quite, quite long odds in a 2 to 1 in a two horse race. It does show, though what base the two teams are coming from. Like, this is all based on what we've seen over the last couple of weeks from England. This was supposed to be, you know, Phil Neville bringing his team in. I don't want to say Phil Neville was in kind of happy-go-lucky form, but he was certainly kind of fairly light-hearted about what this England uh, team might be able to do in terms of actually challenging the favourites of this competition. The more it's progressed, and particularly that Norway result, the more I start to think, was this all sort of a front? Was this all sort of a, a grand plan by this English team to actually go in a little bit under the radar to kind of uh, talk about our, our manager as sort of a man who hasn't been taken too seriously in the past and actually we'll slide under the radar and lo and behold, screw up against the United States and the United States find themselves in a game. Because let's not forget that before the tournament as well, it wasn't exactly like everybody was lavishing praise on the States. It wasn't as if this is the, the greatest team in world football. No, we were all, well, so all of the research, all of the previews that we did suggested that the French could probably take them, that it was going to be one of those situations where this American team were as good as other American teams um, who have won the World Cup, and that um, the French were coming for us. So now the French are gone, despite the fact that they dominated the game. And I don't know. I mean, are England, is, it, is it really that one-sided? No, it's not. That, that's my point. I think that those odds are very, very healthy. And that if you, uh, if you are looking for a bit of value tonight, it might actually be in that England. That those odds are based on this tournament uh, as much as anything else, based on the fact that America have come roaring into this tournament and knocked out the, the hosts and the team that many people would have fancied to go all the way. Mm. All right. Um, a couple of things that uh, we want to talk about uh, in the next few minutes in the show. We're going to talk about the Arsenal... That's our deal or no deal today. 
in terms of the uh, transfer. Generally, no deal with Arsenal. I mean, it's probably a safe bet to go, no deal, no deal, no deal, no deal, yeah. no deal. But it hasn't been a very straightforward transfer window for Arsenal. It's been complicated by the fact, as you were talking about, the, um, the finances uh, are not as healthy at Arsenal as they might have seen on paper. Certainly, their competitive advantage has disappeared. Completely, yeah. As, as I mentioned earlier on, the, the Swiss Ramble tweets from yesterday, always very illuminating when it comes to Arsenal and their finances. And he's saying that the club have basically been... Are we going to get into this now? No, no, we'll, we'll, do, yeah. we'll get into it in a little while. He's basically saying that the profit that Arsenal have been operating under has been a bit of an illusion, especially in the last two seasons. Reading his stuff, it is incredibly worrying where Arsenal are at. And I've always kind of voiced this... Uh, opinion of fatalism around Arsenal, especially after everything that happened over the last couple of years, that this isn't necessarily a bounce like, say, mm. Liverpool had or like uh, Manchester United are going to have. There is no guarantee that Arsenal don't fall through a trapdoor here. Yeah, well, I mean, Liverpool's bounce, uh, like, Liverpool had that one period under Rafa Benitez that was good and then ends badly, and then it's another dark period for a long period, for a long number of years, and before that, it was a dark period before Rafa. So it's like, Liverpool, not the poster boy for how things are supposed to go after a great era. Liverpool under John W. Henry even took a, you know, took them a little while to get to the point where they got the best manager available. That's the key. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Yeah, here's Andy McGinley talking about tiered championships and why his opinion has changed in recent weeks. Um, just in case everyone is, one, is out there is wondering, uh, we'll be bringing you our uh, power rankings a little bit later on in the week. Everybody's doing them now. Owen. Imitation is a sincere form of flattery. They're in every paper. Are they? Ever, ever since you started this. I First noticed. ever official GA power rankings. Our spec savers power rankings will be with you on tomorrow's show. We'll talk about that in a little while. But uh, here's Andy McGinley on tier championships. I'm very worried that the, the, this has got an unstoppable, unstoppable momentum and I don't think we're, we're really going to sit down and look at it. I, I would have been, ironically, I've sort of had a changeover in, in my own thought process. I would have been in favour of tearing just from the from the natural logic of it and seeing these beatings happening at times. Uh, but to be honest, if if we're looking at the overall health in the game, I think the healthiest, most ideal situation long term for the game is to have as many counties as possible up at a similar level, and that all counties are driving towards being at the top or that dream of of managing to win the top. Is that more or less likely bringing in this system that we're heading towards? I think it's far less likely. I think as soon as you divide up the teams and have the top teams playing against each other and the bottom teams playing against each other, I think naturally the top teams will drive each other on and on and on at a greater rate and a faster rate and that difference will become greater. And over time then the chance of ever one of the lower teams being able to catch up and, and make the jump up is, is less. Uh, increasingly I would have liked to see something done with the whole structure of funding and the whole push of games development in the other counties so that we get them up, even if it means curtailing the top counties in terms of money that they have to contribute into the system and that that money goes down to the other counties to get them up. I think if we can level the playing field across more counties than just looking for this top elite group, uh, I think long term in 10 years time, uh, that, that would be a better situation to, to, to be chasing down. Yeah, the, um, to me, the tiers that have been suggested are Pigs Mickey tiers. And they made a right pig's mickey out of the whole situation here. There is, I can't see anybody wanting to stick around to be in a B championship. Oh, there's going to be, there'll be uh, all stars for you and there'll be a trip for the winner. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. There's no promotion, there's no relegation, there's no benefit to winning it really. Like at least with Leash, they get to play Dublin this weekend. And if they were really good and they beat Dublin, they'd be in an All-Ireland quarterfinal. So at the start of the year, they know there's a chance. It's a weird scenario and it's a weird situation. And ultimately, long term, as we've seen from uh, hurlers in Carlo, they don't think that it's going to be long term beneficial to them. Really, what would be long term beneficial would be a massive injection of funding to Leash and Carlo and Kildare and Westmeath and those, that tier of counties in Antrim um, and Offaly. But the format that in the, that have been suggested for the championships that oh everybody in the room was like oh this is great you're a good man John Horan that's great stuff it's like well it doesn't work what's the point of this it's not going to work it's we're going to be sitting here having the same conversations for the next few years about 
what would be a better fix to the current tiered championship that we have. And it's exactly the same scenario that we found ourselves in when we were talking about Donegal's motion about the Super 8s. It's like something, the genesis of an issue being addressed is here. We, if you just, everybody just stepped back a little bit and went, this is the problem, what is the, what is the problem we're trying to fix? And everybody agree on that and then come up with a, ver a range of different solutions that you can try it out for a period of time. What is the solution that we're trying to fix with the Super 8s? Dublin having two home games, how do we fix that? As opposed to Tony Gall come up with a motion and it gets killed and then everybody goes, well, of course the motion wasn't going to succeed. And also, this is bullshit, it needs to get fixed. But instead we come up with this, I, I mean, who actually came up with these proposals? Well, I, w I was saying John Horne yesterday, but I was kind of reluctant to actually say John Horne. I don't think we can say it's Central Council. Well, they were put, they were put to a meeting of Central Council to go forward to a special congress. But whose actual proposals are they? On what basis were they designed? What was the consultative process around that? The fixtures, the, the high-powered committee on fixtures now looks just like window dressing and a talking shop and like an irrelevance. So, if, I mean, I would certainly, if I was in that committee, I would be, I would feel like I've been completely blindsided by these proposals for these fixtures. Because what is it trying to address? We'll come back to this. Um, more tomorrow morning uh, on the latest version of our Specsavers power rankings. Are there any surprises, Owen, that we should be expecting? I presume you've um, got this right this week. There's a shuffle near the very, very top. Are Mayo going second? Are, are you looking for spoilers for the power rankings? I, I think everybody out there just needs to don't lose your shit today, keep your shit, keep it together, and get ready to fling it at Owen tomorrow. That's my advice to you. That's all I'm saying. I don't know what he's done. Sometimes people need a, a reason to vent, and I promise you I'll give you plenty of other reasons to vent. The power rankings is not one of those reasons because they're flawless, they're perfect, and it's like a, a shield of golden armour walking around this very studio. Yeah, uh, they're coming for you. Full, full version, uncut, tomorrow at around about um, whatever time we decide, between half seven and half nine, so you're going to have to tune into the whole show. That's right. Around half eight. Half eight, okay. Uh, it's six minutes past nine this morning. Time for us to get into our deal or no deal Arsenal special. Well, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's do the Arsenal special. It is a one club, it is a one transfer saga that is going to rumble on and on and on. But while it's still exciting, let's talk about this thing. Welford Zaha to Arsenal, Arsenal offering £40 million. Unfortunately, from an Arsenal perspective, Crystal Palace value him at £100 million. Crystal 120, Palace. 120, 120 is the figure that the Sun had this morning. Crystal Palace also happened to be flush with money after selling Aaron Wan-Bissaka for 50 million quid to Manchester United. In terms of his current contract, he signed a five-year contract worth £130,000 a week only last summer. Ooh, so he can look at... Um, see, he can hang on and wait to go to a club that's going to pay him three times that? Arsenal might. Arsenal no, way. sorry, three times that. No, obviously not. Wilfred Zaha is not going to get £390,000 a week. Okay, so he's not going to get three times that. 360. Really? Well, go back to Man United. I'd take 360 grand from Man United if I'm going for that. Will Manchester United take him back? Yeah, they'd be delighted to have him. I'm not sure. I'm not, see, I'm not so sure about this at all. Middle of last season, if you asked me, maybe after the first couple of months of the season, would you take Wilfred Zaha at Arsenal Football Club? I would snap your hand off. I would say 100% yes. Brilliant signing, brilliant move. Now I'm not sure. Now just maybe it's the passing of time. Maybe it's the sort of idea that you brought up earlier in the show that there are just as good options on the continent, certainly cheaper options on the continent, which is really, really important uh, for Arsenal. Like this could all be a ploy to get more money from Crystal Palace. Like he's been unsettled in the past. He signed two five year deals in each of the last two summers. Five year deals, of course, I mean, no, deals mean nothing anymore. Now, part of this is also requiring Arsenal to pay a fee to Manchester United. It's only a proportion of the fee, but it could be around £15 million. Uh, so this is part of a, a sell-on clause. Zaha could, though, hand in a transfer request, and that would waive all his rights to, to loyalty payments and things like that. So there are sort of different elements that we're dealing with here. The other elements that we've mentioned are Zaha's brothers, who are clearly involved on a very intimate level with Zaha's dealings and in terms of where he's going to go. So uh, his brother uh, Irve has played a role as a consultant for the agency that actually smoothed Aaron wan move to, to Manchester United. And then one of his other brothers, he went public on Monday pleading with Palace to lower their valuation and reach an agreement with Arsenal uh, 
to sell them. And he, he went to the Daily Mail and said, Palace said if an opportunity like this presented itself, they would not stand in his way. We hope they still feel that way and they come to an agreement with Arsenal quickly. So this is the situation that we're in. His brothers want him to, to go. He may want to stay. He definitely wants more money. He feels that he'd be valued at more than 130 grand a week. The problem here is that Crystal Palace also want more money and they don't need the money at this point. Now, how much can Arsenal actually stump up? Well, Kieran Maguire, Price of Football on Twitter yesterday, said that Arsenal owe already over £100 million in respect of instalments on other transfers at the moment. They're not exactly flush with cash. They put their transfer dealings, their transfer budget this year, something like £45 million. They don't have the money to go, to go much higher. As I've mentioned as well, the Swiss Ramble thread on Twitter yesterday, it's worth digging out. It's an amazing read in terms of what Arsenal have been doing in terms of their finances over the past 17 years. They've been off operating off a of profit since 2002, Arsenal. We know this. They are set to make a loss for the first time since then at this point, Arsenal. The recent years, though, have been padded by player sales. So that 2002 figure, the reason that they've been in profit since 2002, uh, has been due to a number of reasons. Success, being in the Champions League consistently, last couple of years, not in profit anymore, really, if you take away player sales. So really, if you look at some of the uh, previous quotes, like 2009, after Gazidis had boasted that Arsenal should be able to compete at a level like any club such as Bayern Munich, 2009, they were only £23 million behind Bayern Munich in terms of their profits. This is now £168 million, as recently as uh, 2018. So the gap is growing here, and Arsenal having this notion that they were able to, or Arsenal fans having this notion that they were able to go and spend £60 million on Milford Zaha is patently untrue. Like 2012, if you look at that, they had almost as much cash as the rest of the Premier League combined. So the rest of the Premier League combined is £181 million. Arsenal had £154 million. 2018, the new Premier League TV deals come in. Arsenal now have uh, 231 million pounds. The rest of the Premier League has 686 million pounds. So almost threefold. All these figures kind of add up. The big six is moving away from Arsenal. It's almost like a big five and one at this point. Tottenham have closed the gap drastically in the space of a few years. The club has been run terribly, and one of the people you can point the finger at has been Ivan Gazidis, who you know casually left the club last year. Well, casually got a new job. These things happen. It's more and more looking like he left a sinking ship that he knew that was sinking and that he was responsible for sinking. What's the first thing you do when uh, you're responsible for sinking the ship? Maybe get everybody else off and save everybody else li else's life. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, yeah. Arsenal, Arsenal isn't a sinking ship. It's just... Uh, I've, got great, I've got grave fears for Arsenal in terms of... It's just that their owners aren't putting any money in. That's the choice. It's like the club is relatively well run. It is financially viable. It's got a good stadium in a massive market. This is an Arsenal fan who's obviously very disappointed with how the finances have been run and the opportunity that was blown, and I understand that. But at the same time, if Stan Kroenke decided to pump a little bit of money in, Arsenal could easily afford to buy anybody they want in, in world football because he's rich, and the basis for them to do so would be that the club would be uh, on a sound financial footing, if not. So it's not, it's, it's not uh, profitable because they lost 50 million quid or whatever it is from the... Champions League, but like, so buy the players, get them back into the Champions League. Come on, Stan, get the finger out. Yeah, it's a, it's a chicken and egg situation here. And Blaming Gazidis, who actually did an okay job over the years, uh, is, I think, again, missing the point. It's Stan Kroenke is the problem. I don't think because Stan Kroenke is a problem that absolves even Gazidis of... Ple sorry, you're right. There's plenty, of, there's plenty of blame to go around. Suddenly, uh, we've got the deal or no deal... Uh, Music about uh, five minutes late. Let's just, get on just to do. finish, uh, Deal or No Deal. Let's get on. Is there more? No more? Well, I've just been here to talk about Wilfred Zaha. There is plenty more on Deal or No Deal. Pierre uh, Emerick Aubameyang? Oh, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. What's, uh, this is usually the part where there's a, a list of transfer rumours uh, to do the rounds. Uh, the Pierre Emerick Aubameyang news is are you asking me, is it a Deal or No Deal for him to actually be sold by Arsenal at this time? Yeah. To actually get on board the fact that he is about to become an old man and that Arsenal should basically just Cash give up everything now. and start again? Well, he's, he's only 30, you know. Where does, they, where does the cash again stop with Arsenal? <sighs> when they're in the Championship next like, just hold on three a years' time. The, even because he... Like, the Gazidis thing, is saying that he's irresponsible, if he's the man who was negotiating deals, like, something that gets forgotten quite often in Arsenal's recent past is the Alexis Sanchez deal and what that actually entails. Like, Henrik wow. Mkhitaryan came into the club essentially on a trade, got paid more than Sanchez which is a little bit embarrassing from Arsenal, who sold Sanchez, who was a brilliant football player for Arsenal at that point. Remember, he was brilliant before he went to Manchester United. And that these are the sort of failings we're, we're, we're talking about. Like, getting rid of outstanding talents hasn't, shock and horror, been a, a great move from Arsenal's perspective. So no deal, don't get rid of 
Aubameyang. All right. You feel very disappointed as an Arsenal fan. You feel a, a dark closing in around you, whispering silently in your ear. Well, I, I was saying like for the last couple of seasons that there is a realistic possibility that this may not stop at the falling out of the Champions League stages. Now, you make a Europa League final, I'm like, it's okay, I'm, I'm back, on, back on board with this thing again. And now all of a sudden this, this summer is illuminating. You're the new Southampton is what, what I'm hearing from you on. Is that it? The new Leeds. Uh, no, you're not going to be there. Extremely strong. All right. We are delighted to announce that 3 and 20 by 20 will bring you a very special off the ball roadshow celebrating role models and the essential part they play in getting women and girls into sport. It's next Thursday, the 11th of July. We're going to gather some of the greatest sporting talent Ireland has ever produced to find out what made them fall in love with sports and who helped them along the way. So, our host of legends includes Olympic icon Sonia Sullivan, Annalise Murphy, Rena Buckley, Mary O'Connor, Jessica Harrington, and Kate Harrington. The live show takes place in the Alex Hotel. Limited tickets are available to register now. Go on to offtheball.com forward slash events. There's no age limit for this event, so all are welcome. It is an exclusive off air event, though, so the only way you can see it is by being there. For more information, head over to offtheball.com forward slash events. It is uh, 9 15 a.m. We're back with Phil Egan right after these. The Sport Ireland campus Blanchardstown is the home of Irish sport, not just for our athletes, but for you and the community. Check out our amazing offers for families with kids' camps, sport academies and birthday parties. Or for adults, why not join our gym with a 50-metre pool? Or your club, school, friends can book one of our world-class indoor or outdoor facilities, including our brand new field sport covered pitches. Find out more on nationalsportscampus.ie. Join Bruce Betting now for a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. That's right. New Irish accounts can enjoy a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. So if your first bet loses, we'll refund your stake with a free bet. Now that's giving you more. Bruce Betting. In store, online and now on your phone. T's and C's apply. Please gamble responsibly. See dunlouis.net. So this is a uh, school sport Father's Day. Who's that on the inside lane? Streaking home. Do you recognise that running, running motion? Did his hamstring on the way there. Who was that? Do you recognise him? Michael Owen. Michael yeah. Owen. So, like, he, uh, he had a bit left in the tank as well there. He, was, he eased off. Usain bolted. Also, I'd say a little bit scared of hitting that top gear now. Yeah. Reaches okay. that point where he can't do it anymore. If you're one of the other dads, you're thinking, why not test that hamstring? Oh, come on, you've got to, this is your one chance for glory. Somebody's going to have that, right? Absolutely. Carl Frampton, I thought, didn't win his by very much. So he also, he did the same thing. Why, was it dad's school day week or something like that? No, oh, it's the end of, end of school year, yeah. Is that, is that something that dad's happens? Dad's school day week. Or whatever. Is that, have you taken part in any sports days? Yeah, of course, yeah. All the dads do. Is it I always a sprint? Thing. Generally, like, generally that, that looked quite a long one. Almost like it was fixed to the ex-Premier League footballer could win it. Normally it's like 40 yards and so no one dies. When is the dad's 20 kilometre cycle? I don't know, but I mean, obviously I'd crush that too, so. Just wondering, just, just trying to see when you get to play to your strengths. That's impressive by Owen. As you say, Usain Bolt like pulling up at the end. Should have done a celebration. Should have, like Michael Owen. I'm a I, was, I was about to say, he would be the type of guy to do that sort of thing, but we have it on record that he's the type of guy to do that sort of thing when that video with Neville Southall when Michael Owen destroyed like a poor 14-year-old goalkeeper and every time he like nutmegged him he started celebrating wildly. That is the exact sort of thing that Michael Owen would do. So beating other dads in a sprint. Now like, you spit out a character that he didn't celebrate, to be honest. Well, I mean, he could have celebrated. He could have. I mean, and again, that's the right thing to do, right? Totally. Instead of like, oh, I'm embarrassed, that's... Gotta own that, no? Like, 100%. You've you got to just crush them down and say, I am a far better athlete than all of you. Absolutely. Look at what I've done. Well, what do his kid, if he doesn't win, like, how does he explain that to the kids? I, I agree, Phil. He's got to do it. Should have worn his Real Madrid I am, I am looking forward to the uh, uh, Dad's School Day Week thing becoming a thing, though, Owen. So, looking forward to that. I'm glad that you've invented it. Dad School Day Week. Today on the show. Well it's, a, it's a very snappy name. It's known by uh, that name everywhere. Phil, what have you got for us? Well, I was just listening to your conversation about Wilfred Zaha. David Seaman actually has um, come out and said, like, why are they going after Wilfred Zaha at Arsenal? Like, they, they need players in different positions. I don't actually agree with him. Yeah, that's like, a, that is a fair point. They need defenders. They can't mm -hmm. defend. Uh, do they need a philosophy change in defending? Like... I see yeah. they've uh, relegated Steve Bowles to a different position, 
within the club, so that they get in somebody new. Because of course, he whenever he asks to keep a clean sheet, it's like the Steve Bold's philosophy is working. <laughs> Steve Bold effect. <laughs> and then if they get hammered, Steve Bold obviously doesn't have any say in that dressing room. Yeah. <laughs> well, Freddie Youngberg is in there now, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, Steve Bold. So maybe they are going for a more attacking uh, coach with Youngberg. But yeah, they don't have a set formation. He looks at different teams and he, he changes it up. Like there was times Mustafi was playing as a right fullback, an orthodox back four. Like I suppose it's quite easy to compare Arsenal to Liverpool of when Klopp took over, where they wanted to get back into the Champions League. They actually got to a Europa League final in his first season. And lost it, and everybody was like, oh, this guy can't win finals. Yeah, and Ooh, actually, he? I think that was a good thing. Well, I suppose they would have got back, they would have got into the Champions League. But they didn't have the squad, whereas the following season Klopp was able to play a style where Liverpool could put the foot on the gas and they had more recovery time. They didn't have European football. Who did they sign after they lost the Europa League final? Um, they would have had the likes of... G they would have signed like Gini Wijnaldum. Wijnaldum window. Salah? Yeah. Salah would have been the year after. The year after that. Okay. Mane. Mane. So you're adding Gini Wijnaldum, you're adding Sadio Mane to that team after the Europa League final. They're good additions. Arsenal's additions this year. But Sadio Mane hadn't reached the full price inflation just yet. I mean, it was the start of that price. It was still 35 million, was he? Yeah, well, like he was, was initially linked with United and people thought, what are they doing? And then Liverpool signed them and again, you know, the joke about, oh, they're going back to Southampton. Yeah. And it, it was thought, like, he's a decent player. Yeah. But he, like, even his debut against Arsenal, his league debut, you got, you got the glimpse of how good Mane was going to be. Villa fans knew all about him from that uh, eight-minute hat-trick or however long it was. I was about to say, like, he had shown glimpses of absolute excellence in the Premier League before that. And I think it's actually a perfect case study comparing where Mane was back then to where Zaha is now. In fact, I think Mane back then is a better signing than Wilfred Zaha is now, I think. For half the price. I, I, re I really don't think that... Like, if Arsenal managed to get you know fooled into paying £70 million for Wilfred Zaha, it will be a really bad piece of business. Yeah, you believe the deficiencies in the Arsenal team last season wasn't lack of goals, wasn't a lack of creating chances, it was trying to keep clean sheets. Midfield as well, if Torreira goes, which he looked like a really good prospect, uh, the second half of the season wasn't great for him. Um, obviously, he likes Gazidis, he's going to go to AC Milan by the looks of it. Arsenal's only hope is if a Chinese club gets an ocean and decides that Mesut Ozil and Shkodra and Mustafi are really good footballers and they deserve to be paid handsomely, even more than they're getting paid at Arsenal because they can offload that dead wood and they can offload the wages, most importantly, the wages. That is the thing that... I wonder will Dalian Yafang, Dalian Yafang, hmm? Dali and Yafang Rafa Benitez is new club, maybe they'll come in for Mesut Ozil. Definitely uh, the sort of player that Rafa Benitez would love to manage Mesut Ozil. It's a weight around the neck at this point. It is like Alexis Sanchez. You can almost, you can almost put together a list of who is the most annoying player to have at the club right now in terms of what the club can't do. Alexis Sanchez is one of them. Mesut Ozil is another one of them. I'm sure there's Gareth Bale is another one. There's tons of these players all around the world. You can make a dream team of players that are the really fall guy. heavy Deadwood. The Fall Guy 11. They're not Fall Guys. They're o overrated. Yeah, they're but there, Sturridge would have been at Liverpool until there was just that two games where he didn't know if everybody go, that's okay, fair enough. That goal against you. Chelsea. That we will you some time, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's... The, 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 there's a serious worry about Arsenal. Like, that even the likes of Wolves and Everton could close the gap. That, that's my point. The trap, the trap door is no longer top four down to five and six. The tr there, a new trap door has developed Arsenal. It's right below you. You could drop out of the top six. Mesut Ozil's contract runs out on the 30th of June 2021. So you've this season We're and bollocks. the following season. <laughs> <laughs> We're absolutely of, bollocks. Of paying Mesut Ozil a lot of money to do not very much. I, in fairness, you come up with a great assist against Leicester or Burnley at the Emirates but he won't play in the, the other games because he tends to get ill a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's you know, the smog in London is obviously very bad. <laughs> they could get him some, one of those Dysons, just to follow him around, just hear him as a breathe through this. That would be... <laughs> they should just, like, sell Scott or Mustafi and put all the resources into Benelin for flu and Ventolin inhalers, or whatever they're called. The blue inhalers. You'd probably fail drugs tests. I wonder, could you... Oh, anyway. No, go on. 
I wonder, could you like, you know, spike him so that he fails that and then you don't have to pay him for breach of contract? That is such a good idea. I, mean, I really regret you saying that on the record because I wanted to write to Arsenal. Have that for nothing, Arsenal. OK, well, USA and England tonight, defending champions, three-time winners of the USA. England have never got to the final of the Women's World Cup. But USA have the, the advantage in terms of head-to-head. -head. They've won 10 of the previous 16 meetings between the two. England boss Phil Neville says he's been planning for a meeting with the US since the day he took the England job and he's back in the side to go one step further than they did four years ago. You get to these moments in life and you think grasp it with both both hands, both feet, all your body and, and that's what we've been saying to the players. You know, don't get to a semi-final now and have any regrets. Don't get to a semi-final and think afterwards should have, would have, could have. Get to a semi-final and get out there and play your best. Did you know Phil Neville never actually uh, played in the World Cup for England? I hope that's... That's a really good question and should be used at a pub quiz sometime. Phil, Phil you, you never actually played, so that's uh, the only thing you reached semi final here. I remember about the Euros, all right. As do Romania when they got the penalty from him. Uh, Leon, 57,000 people are expected in Leon for that game tonight. That's the same stadium where Ireland suffered the heartbreak against France at oh, the yeah. Euros. Uh, it's, a, it's an 8 o'clock kickoff. They reckon it actually won't be too hot by the time kickoff comes along. It'll have cooled down. But yeah, really looking forward to it. You'd have to tip the USA to win. Yeah. But I hope they win. I, I like this Lionesses team. I think when you think of the ridicule when Phil Neville got the job. He's a redeemed man. Could you imagine if they won the World Cup? <laughs> he will be the next director of football at Manchester United. Dundalker, eight points clear at the top of the SSE or Tricity League Premier Division. So it's as you were. The champions followed up on their win over Shamrock Rovers with a 3-0 win at home to Waterford last night. And they were ahead after only two minutes. Kenny Brown scored an own goal. Daniel Kelly and Jamie McGrath were also on target. Second place, Shamrock Rovers got back to winning ways. They beat St. Pat's 2-0 at Richmond Park. The goal is coming from Greg Bulger and Sean Kavanagh. Nil all between Bohemians and Derry City at Daly Mount Park. Also finished scoreless between Finn Harps and Cork City. And a hat-trick from Ronan Coughlin gave Sligo Rovers a 5-1 win over UCD. I mentioned Rafa Benitez. Uh, Dalian Yafang have actually confirmed that Benitez is the new head coach. And uh, he's going to get £12 million per season. Not bad. Uh, Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal in first round action at Wimbledon today. Federer will play Lloyd Harris. Nadal will face Yushi Sugita of Japan. Defending women's champion Angelique Kerber also in action against Tatiana Maria. And Serena Williams is up against Yulia Gatto Monteconi. Top seed Ashley Barty also in action. And uh, obviously 15-year-old Corey Goff grabbed the headlines on day one. She beat five-time winner Venus Williams in the first round. And she said it was extra special to do it against her idol. I mean, obviously I'm, su I'm super shocked. Um, but I'm just super blessed that uh, Wimbledon decided to give me the wild card. I mean, I never expected this to happen. Um, obviously, I, I literally got my dream draw. Yeah, just one bit of news then as well. Lee Keegan it's, looks like he's going to miss the round four qualifier for Mayo against Galway at the Gaelic Grounds on Saturday. Suffered an ankle injury during the win over our man. Uh, the injury stacking up for James Horan is obviously without Dermot O'Connor, Matthew Ruan, Seamus O'Shea, and Tom Parsons. There's also doubts over Jason Doherty as well. So certainly the uh, the odds are starting to stack against them, but. I always find that when you expect Mayo to lose, they don't. Uh, where, uh, where's your, are you here for the weekend? Are you in Mayo for the weekend? No, I'll be here. No, so, okay, so there's a good yeah, chance they might win. Told you. Uh, all right. So um, if you missed anything, you can catch us back in the podcast or you can hear all of our highlights across the day on OTB Sports Radio, our new fully dedicated sports radio station. Some brilliant pieces coming your way across the day. A Legends interview with the Kerry record breaker, Dennis Ogie Morin. And there's also this when Philly McMahon popped in for the Keith Andrews Show back in December 2018. There was a light bulb moment in 2013. I had the cup and I was bringing it to a youth club to do a talk. And I walked into me, me house and all these kids came over and asked me for, for my autograph. And I was like, cool, no bother. Uh, I went back into the house, got a bit of lunch, came back down. And one of the, the, the brothers kid, one of the brothers of the, the kids that was signing the jersey came over and says, oh, I missed you, can I get an autograph? And I said, yeah, no problem. And he said, um, he said are you famous? You famous looked up at me and I was like, oh, what do I say here? And before I even said yes or no, he said, you must be, you're on telly. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. And then he said, but hold on, you can't be famous because you're from Ballymun. Right? Yeah. So I sat down on the path 
right? There was me, the kid, and the cup for about 10 minutes. And I'm sure cars driving by were going, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Crash like, this is box. crazy, like, yeah. I don't know what I gave that kid that day. Mm. I don't know, I hope I gave him something. Right? Some little bit of uh, a boost of encouragement from something I said, right? But I felt great. I felt amazing. I felt three foot taller. I remember speaking to a friend of mine who's a personal development coach and I said it to him, I told him that story and he said, right, he said, that's what you need to do in life. He said, get as many people as you can on the biggest path as possible and go after that. Because when you're dead and gone, that's what you'll be remembered for. Not how many all Ireland you have, or what house you have, or what car you have, or how much money you have, but how much energy you give people. So that's when it tweaked that. Sport can be a very powerful thing in terms of a platform to help others. So every chance and every bit of time we have, I'm going to use it. Mm. It's uh, pretty impressive stuff there from Philly McMahon talking about that uh, moment with the penny drop for him. He's an impressive character really, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all right. That's all we've got time for. That full thing coming your way a little bit later on OTB Sports Radio. You can check out the schedule for that on offtheball.com forward slash radio. And we will see you tomorrow bright out and bushy tail. Good luck. OTB AM. Brought to you by Avancard Reward Plus Credit Card. Powered by MasterCard. Straight up better than your current credit card. Avancard DAC is regulated.